sorry maybe uh, yeah sorry so, sorry i actually i have uh, had a problem with my uh, with my uh, the camera of my laptop uh, so so what i was extremely sorry, sorry because i was going on speaking and nobody told me yeah thank you mm. so again welcome to the the second day of this this uh, young researchers international webinar on the evolution of bengali identity in, uh, reflections in literature culture and society uh, what i started talking about is that this uh, webinar is being organized uh, by postscriptum which is an interdisciplinary journal in literary studies published from the department of english uh, uh, sharad centenary college and uh, i uh, was just trying to take a couple of minutes to introduce our journal to all of you uh, we started this journal in 2016 and i personally believe in open access and i also believe that if we are researching we researchers if we are researching our research output is definitely valuable uh, and and uh, uh, if we want to share our research output with the world uh, we as researchers uh, Uh, should not uh, uh, be asked for money uh, which is the case in many journals you know about the uh, article processing fee and uh, all these things so we wanted from our institution we wanted to start this journal uh, where we will not take any money and uh, we will keep our journal open access uh, for everyone so that is how uh, we have been running this journal since 2016 uh, two issues in a, in each year mm, and uh, we were in the ugc list ugc list is very important these days uh, we all know about this so we were in the ugc list but uh, uh, then the ugc list changed into the uh, uh, care list uh, ugc care list uh, and now we are not there but still Uh, i must say that we are there in the doaj the directory of open access journals which is one of the pioneers in the open access movement and i hope you all of you know that open access movement is a huge thing we are going into an era where not only journals not only research articles even books even uh, 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 valuable books will come into open access domain so so this is very futuristic so and this is very post scriptum as well because uh, when uh, post scriptum is something appended to the main script this journal mm, is about interdisciplinary literary studies when we are talking uh, uh, when uh, our discourses on any text any kind of text whether it is an it is a written text or uh, a non scriptural script in that sense maybe our research discourses are all of our research discourses are actually uh, uh, appendices to uh, the main text on which we are building such deep discourses so this is what i just wanted to tell you all about uh, post scriptum sorry i forgot to turn my mic on so we lost a couple of minutes uh, now uh, i would like to welcome uh, you all and welcome uh, dr dipendu das uh, especially uh, professor of english and dean of uh, shuniti kumar chattopadhyay uh, school of english and foreign uh, language studies at the university of, uh, at assam university silchar and he will be talking on he is our most distinguished uh, invited speaker for the second day of this webinar and he will be speaking on being bengali in india's northeast construction construction of identity and then we are looking forward to a really uh, 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 enlightening uh, interactive session because i have shared a story with uh, many of you uh, the participants mostly mm, uh, who's email i had so so that story and what dipendu da is going to tell uh, uh, going to talk about now is uh, very much similar so that's why i thought that i should share this story dipendu da thank you so much for uh, being here uh, may i now invite you uh, to turn your mic on and camera on please uh, the 
virtual space is yours now. Good afternoon. Uh, Anuj, am I uh, audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, visible also? Yes, yes. Perfectly. Yes. Okay. So, audio, audio is not that no, clear no. though. Audio is not that clear though, The but the video is all right. So, do you think you are going to use a Just headphone a or something? Just a minute. Uh, yeah, I'll just yeah, try sure. to use this and let me tell me what is the uh, outcome. Hello. Uh, better, better, perfect. It's uh, better now. now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Namaskar, the principal of Sarucha Satin College, member of the Department of English and other colleagues of the college, to build a post-disciplinary journal of literary studies on the this depend on the your your audio is your audio is getting interrupted. No. Audio is getting interrupted. Then, uh, why you May I su suggest oh. that uh, you can leave this platform once and then re enter again? That might help. Oh. Yes, we'll come back. <laughs> Hello, am I audible? Am yes, you, you are. Yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Depend on the, the when you depend on the, when you start speaking, uh, your audio is getting very much interrupted. Otherwise, uh, for small sentences, uh, it's perfectly all right. But when you 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 are speaking continuously, uh, uh, your audio is getting interrupted very much. Okay, I I will just call you up. I'll just call you up. Uh,
just had a talk uh, with Dr. Dash. Uh, it is ba basically a technical problem. Uh, he is tra trying to sort it out. He will, he will be back uh, within a couple of minutes. Uh, sorry for this inconvenience. Please be patient. Uh, I think he will be back here in a, within a couple of minutes. Hello. Hello, uh, Ramanuj. Uh, am I audible now? Hello. Yes, perfectly. Uh, oh. Perfectly. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Sorry for the much better. Yes. Actually, thank you so much. My broadband has incurred some problem this morning. From this morning. Uh, okay. So, Moshka, uh, to all of you once again. Uh, now, uh, I uh, am thankful to the college authority and the organizers of uh, Post Scriptum, uh, the interdisciplinary journal of literary studies, and particularly to Dr. Ramanuj Konar, who has uh, invited me particularly for this uh, particular uh, webinar. Uh, dear uh, delegates, uh, the participants, the research scholars and students, and whoever is there on the other side uh, listening to this uh, 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 deliberation. At the outset, as I uh, uh, told you that I would like to thank the organizers, and I wish uh, this particular uh, program a grand success. Now, in sync with the theme of the webinar, I decided to talk on the subject of Bengali identity in the context of one of the spaces beyond centers, which has been in the context of, or in the vortex of unrest from time to time on the issues concerning territoriality and identity. Now, as you know, the title of my paper is being Bengali in India's Northeast, constriction slash construction of identity. And I have added two more, uh, uh, three more words uh, to it. This is responses in literature. So what I'll do is that uh, in the context of the first part of my presentation that is being Bengali in India's Northeast and construction and constriction of constriction and construction of identity, I'll also take up uh, four short stories uh, from uh, the from uh, the northeast of India, particularly Assam, Bengali short stories, to understand the issue and to explore the issue of the which is mentioned in the title. Now, I'll start with one uh, particular incident which happened to one uh, person who is a Bengali, uh, a very poor man, uh, lower caste. Now, this is very important. Uh, why I'm 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 uh, telling this? I'll uh, poor and lower caste because uh, the issues with identity it happens with all, but then to a large extent in the context of CAA and the context of uh, NRC 
uh, issues like NRC, these uh, they uh, actually bear the brunt uh, of the whole uh, problem to a large extent. Now, Manik Dash, a poor Bengali from Udharban, let's say if you have come to Silchar, you know that Udharban is on the way uh, from Silchar to the uh, airport, uh, Silchar town to the airport. So it is a suburb. Now, this man was arrested in the month of October 2008 by Assam police as he was on his way to sell his bananas in the market. He was taken for an illegal migrant from Bangladesh, beaten up mercilessly, and after a few days was pushed to Bangladesh through Mohishashan Indo Bangladesh border. Now, he then received several rounds of beating from Bangladesh rifles for a couple of days and finally pushed back to India through another border. Now, completely shattered, Manikdash was found wandering aimlessly in the forest near a border village of Kachar district. Some organizations then took up his case and was subsequently discovered that there were several valid documents in support of his being, being an Indian citizen. His name featured in the voters list. There was evidence of his father's migration to India from East Pakistan through Jokiganj, now in Bangladesh, and his father being an inmate of Karimganj, a town in Assam, uh, in the refugee camp, where a refugee card, that serial number 3547, 3547, had been issued against his father's name on the 12th of September, 1964. Now, all these are perfectly valid documents, even though he had all such valid documents in support of being a bona fide Indian citizen. A case had been lodged against Manik Dash as a foreign national, case number FP30-2006. And he was served a notice by the court. Now, a poor, uneducated man, Manik Dash, could not realize the consequence of not responding to the summon from the court in due time. This ultimately devastated him completely and crushed his family life, even though today, he is absolved of all the accusations of being a foreign national. I mean, legally, Manik Das today is a completely shattered man and still lives in the trauma of the fateful experience. This I have quoted from, uh, uh, I have uh, quoted from a newspaper article which was published in the year 2008. Now, what happened with Manik Das is not a case in isolation. Such instances are in plenty. Living a life with the label, the slur, the, the stigma of being a suspected foreigner or constantly remaining in the unease of living in someone else's home have been some undeliable scars that remained ingrained in the psyche of almost every Bengali in the northeastern part of India. The plight of Manik Dash is reminiscent of not merely the thousands of real life victims of the partition of India in the Eastern part, who had migrated to the Northeastern part of India, particularly to Assam, but also of all the Bengalis in general. The partition of India in the Eastern part thus culminated in the course of time to be the most significant determining factor in the socio-political context of the Northeast India, particularly Assam in the post-independence period to the extent that even till date, uh, this has played a crucial role in all the parliamentary and assembly elections in the state, most of which centered around the issues of identity. Consequently, the partition has been the most decisive factor in the evolution, the, consolid the constriction, and the construction of Bengali identity in the northeast of India. The partition of 1947 and the corollary migration meant not merely one-time displacement for the Bengalis of the Northeast, rather it brought a lifelong threat of dislocation and perennial crisis of identity, not only for them, but also for the subsequent generations as well. In this connection, 
द मेमोयर ऑफ बाय मनोज फिराक भट्टाचार्य पब्लिश्ड इन अल जजीरा 26 फरवरी 2020 रिटन एट द बैकड्रॉप ऑफ असम एजिटेशन दैट स्टार्टेड इन 1977 सॉरी 1979 विद द प्लेज ऑफ द डिपोर्टेशन ऑफ फॉरेनर्स नाउ दिस राइट अप बाय मनोज फिराक भट्टाचार्य व्हिच वाज पब्लिश्ड ऑन 26th ऑफ फरवरी 2020 explores the historical tension that prevails in the state of assam on the issues of migration and identity some excerpts from the article may be cited to explore the issues of being a bengali in the post independent period in the northeast and i quote from his writer the political concern of the assamese community was the and this is in the context of assam agitation and he write he is writing about in 2020 he is writing about uh, 19 uh, 1979 during assam agitation he was a small boy at that time the political concern of the assamese community was that large scale migration was threatening to turn them into linguistic minority assam's leaders argued that the number of refugees from east pakistan fleeing conflict and civil war with west pakistan which ultimately led to the creation of bangladesh in 1971 had created a demographic imbalance endangering the rights of the indigenous assamese a term borrowed from colonial lexicon they demanded that refugees from bangladesh arriving between january 1 1966 and march 24 1971 should be made ineligible for citizenship rights in the assam accord of 1985 signed between assam students leaders and rajiv gandhi government march 24 1971 was set as the cut off date for identifying and expelling foreigners mainly immigrants from bangladesh dates were matter of political negotiation but did not matter when it came to targeting people in the street for the language they spoke my father a bengali hindu refugee from maimonsingh then in east pakistan who came to assam in 1951 to join the northern frontier frontier railway was a foreigner my mother was born in assam but since her parents hailed from dhaka she she too was a foreigner quote unquote foreigner i inherited the distinction of being a foreigner by birth the partition of india in 1947 was unapologetically unkind to people from the severed provinces of punjab which was divided between india and the then uh, west pakistan now pakistan and bengal which was divided between india and east pakistan now bangladesh now manoj bhattacharjee goes on to add and i quote from him on learning that i was a foreigner within court i felt like a fruit sliced into two i was old enough to realize that my ties to my land of birth had been altered forever i was a moment it was a moment of multiple severances all that i thought belonged to me suddenly no longer did my home my garden my street my neighborhood my school the road to guwahati the shops in nearby fancy bazaar even my grandmother's house belonging was a matter of right and i did not possess that right even by birth the land belonged to someone else the most fundamental feeling that it stayed that has stayed with me since that day is one of groundlessness unquote it is evident that the specter of the partition still hovers over the life of the bengali even after more than 70 years of the fateful event as the bogey of migration has time and again been utilized for maneuvering and inciting passionate outbursts sometimes resulting to ethnic conflicts northeast now a newspaper in a it is it's a, no, a newspaper from meghalaya in a report published on 1st march 2020 mentions the plights of bengali residents of ichamoti and majai the two villages in meghalaya and they and these two villages are 
Bengali uh, uh, dominated area, uh, Bengali dominated uh, localities. Now, these two villages in Meghalaya situated on the Bangladesh border, who have been, these people have been made hostage following the clashes between two groups, one in favor of CAA or CA, what do you uh, people uh, popularly call, and the other against the act. HNLC, a tribal organization, uh, uh, local uh, organization, has issued an ultimatum to all the Hindu Bengalis who had been living there for several generations to leave Ichamoti and Majai area at Stella, at Shela in East Kashi Hills within one month. And I quote the, uh, uh, what was said by the secretary of the, uh, that organization, and I quote him, if they fail to do so by not complying with our ultimatum, that we shall not be made responsible in case of any eventuality. This time, it shall be a mass bloodshed, Sage said, SNLC General Secretary Kam Publicity Secretary Shen Kupar Nongtro in a statement in the uh, month of February 2020. With regard to the issue of migration in Northeast India, contrary to the popular and contemporary discourse on it, which has chosen mostly to view it as a colonial and post-colonial phenomenon, it is to be noted that from time immemorial, time immemorial, the northeastern part of India has remained a site of migration and displacement. And this complex web of migratory practices has played important roles in giving shape to the culture, politics, and demography of the region. So all the, all the uh, I mean, so-called indigenous people in northeast have migrated, and I have the long list, I'm not going to uh, 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 mention those because that that may <coughs> uh, probably create problem with our time management. Now it can be said that the northeast, uh, northeast, including Assam, the largest state in the region, has been a witness to phenomenal dislocation and migration of people in the pre-colonial, colonial, and post-colonial period. So migration is not merely a post-colonial or post-independence affair. Or rather, uh, uh, so it is a. It, it has been going on in. Uh, it has been going on in Northeast from time immemorial. And then, uh, so uh, those were for uh, different reasons. And also, another very important reason was the establishment of tea industry in the region. And on certain other occasions, due to political drawing and redrawing of boundaries before and after the partition of India. The en masse cross-border migrations from the East Bengal, subsequently East Pakistan, to West Bengal and to the northeastern part of India, particularly Assam and Tripura, spread through several decades in the wake of India's partition, 1946 to 47. During the Borishal riot in 1950, East Pakistan riot of 1964, Indo-Pak war in 1965, and during Bangladesh Liberation War in 1971, has further added to tensions and issues arising out of intercultural interface in the region. All these have resulted to the emergence of a quintessential multicultural society having indigenous populations of various ethnicities and races, as well as migrant populations with an ever greater racial and ethnic variety. Though the partition of undivided India took place in both the eastern and the western uh, borders, visible dif differences in the nature and impact of the two persist. Firstly, the partition in the western front, that is Punjab, was a one-time event, where the movement and migration was a two-way process, both from east to the west and from the west to the east Punjab. After some times, when the initial tension subsided, the flow of migration came to an end. On the other hand, the migration following the partition of East Bengal was a prolonged process, which went on for a long period of time and was largely a one-way traffic. Second, the treatment of the state and the central government towards the partition victims of the East and the West was not the same. 
the crisis in punjab was considered as a national emergency to be tackled almost on a war footing soon after the massacre the union government felt it a moral responsibility to rehabilitate the refugees on the other hand the same sense of urgency was lacking on the eastern side though the process of migration remained an unclosed chapter the upsurge of religious identity among the bengali played a pivotal role towards the partition of bengal in 1947 that we all know after the independence the issues of identity took slightly different course in the two parts of us to bengal while west bengal witnessed the emergence and preeminence of class identity promoted by leftist political parties in the socio political and cultural discourses east pakistan so so the preeminence of bengali cultural identity over the religious identity for a period at least which brought about a unification of muslim and hindu bengalis that culminated in the liberation of east pakistan and the formation of bangladesh in 1971 however the religious identity gained upper hand in bangladesh particularly after the murder of <coughs> mujibur rahman which was culminated in the removal of the principle of secularism from the constitution of bangladesh in 1977 by jiaur rahman and replaced with a statement of and i quote absolute trust and faith in almighty allah unquote as islam was declared the state religion in 1988 this ambivalence of our bengali identity this ambivalence of our bengali identity i repeat found reflection in the representation of the partition or rather the pregnant silence over the colossal even in bengali literature of both the sides of the border wherever the epic as observed by george lucas is written in a settled culture where identity is stable life unchangeable the novel form is an expression of and i quote transcendental homelessness from lucas of course if and i quote once again and this is from <clears throat> Uh, a book of uh, title barbware fence and uh, from the introduction of this book edited by nirmal kanti bhattacharjee and uh, dipendu das that is me and i and uh, and i quote from the introduction one sentence if this is true that is what lucas has said the days of homelessness during bengal's partition and huge migration of people contained all the ingredients of great novels but those novels remained unwritten Unquote. This makes Hassan Ajizul Haq lament in his Kotha Shaitir Kotha Kotha, and I <coughs> quote from him. And translation is mine. When lakhs of people who could never imagine of leaving their motherland to flee their country to escape death, di uh, dishonor, and persecution were rendered homeless and refugees, Bengali literature chose not to serve its obligations. Unquote. to portray the extent of the pain and the trauma faced by bengali society a survey of partition literature makes it evident that the representation of the partition in the western front is more visible than that of the eastern part however the reason for the lack of representation of the partition of the eastern part of bengal uh, sorry in eastern part in bengali literature have rarely been thoroughly addressed and i now i refer to one short story by monoj boshu which was published in rangamati of october 1947 it was a shaitya kutir publication and in that publication uh, 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 this uh, 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 magazine also published the famous poem of onnoda shankar rai uh, the famous bards rather teler shishi bhanglo bole khukur pore rak paro so in that short story by monoj boshu uh, mukosto mukosto bhaktrita monoj boshu boshu's story begins in the context of the agitation in the wake of the partition of bengal in 1905 so the story has two lectures one the lecture which is given by a pandit moshai of uh, the school teacher of a village Uh, so after 1905 after the bongo bongo the primary school master of the village has been 
invited to chair a meeting uh, convened by some uh, educated youths of the village. The school teacher does not understand the intricacies of bongo bongo or politics. So the organizers prepare a speech for him, which he memorizes, remaining awake throughout the night. The first sentence of the speech reads, and I quote, because of the striking of the eggs by the foreign rulers, the frame of our mother today is cut into two pieces, unquote. The inflammatory address cannot be completed as the police wielding sticks jump over the crowd and start be beating up the mob. The school teacher, that is Pondit Mosha, is arrested. He instantly turns a hero among the local people. He is accorded a grand felicitation after he is freed from jail after a few days. As the country wins independence in 1947, that is after 42 years of the partition of Bengal in 1905, through the dissection of the country, the school teacher is invited to ho hoist the national flag as a veteran freedom fighter. Now this Pandit Moshai, an extremely old man now, begins to make a speech after unfurling the flag. He repeats the same old lecture he had memorized 42 years back. And he begins, because of the striking of the eggs by the foreign rulers, the frame of our mother today is cut into two pieces. The gathering becomes so angry now on him that they force him to give up the speech. People, just after the independence, are no longer ready to shed tears. This, this story is symptomatic of the indifference of the rebellions of India immediately over the final partition of Bengal in the wake of the independence of India. The rise of leftist ideology in Bengal left a tremendous mark on the partition literature from the state. The communal violence, the division of the country in the name of religion, the exodus from East Pakistan were some uncomfortable truths the Bengali did not want to face as exploring such subjects creatively was fraught with the dire consequences of getting branded as communal and not progressive, I quote and unquote progressive, in India as dominant trend te tendency during the period was to address different socio-political issues in the terms of class, class struggle. As Shivanti Ghosh observes, and I quote her, the political climate played an equally significant role in determining the nature of the creative apprehension of partition experience in West Bengal. As the Communist Party of India gained a stronger foothold in this state than in other parts of India, the entire literary and artistic world uh, <clears throat> of West Bengal bore unmistakable signs of communist control and as a consequence, a deep-seated ideological discomfort about partition, unquote. She goes on to add, and I quote her, to fight communalism in all its manifestations was the explicit instruction to the communist and leftist of India after the August, 19, uh, August riot of 1946. But how could an author write about partition or the refugees without referring to, the, the, to these communal construction of identities? Could the speakers in biographies or uh, the authors of fiction locate violence with its independent trajectory without being distributed over an anonymous population designated by the terms Hindu and Muslim? This is where the Bengali left-leaning authors faltered gravely and as a result tended to shy away from addressing the violence of partition." Unquote. The liberation movement in East Pakistan and the formation of Bangladesh in 1971 was viewed as a reassertion of the supremacy of cultural identity over the religious and the, and the, and the camaraderie developed during the Bangladesh freedom struggle played a significant role in tying up once again some of the traditional knots between the Hindu and the Muslim Bengalis. The air of pent-up anger and suspicion gradually began to melt 
and give way to the atmosphere where a meaningful dialogue did not appear to be a real a remote possibility the literature now <clears throat> uh the literate your now i find certain comments which i will respond liberation is over the literate yours now no longer hesitated to explore the issues related to the partition which began to gain momentum particularly in the decade of the 50 50th anniversary of the event in the context of the dislocation and migration that remain crucial to the post colonial and globalized experience globalized world experience the issues concerning displacement in the northeast particularly assam acquire further dimension as one attempts to probe probe deeply into the matter the referendum of select district on 6th and 7th july of 1947 that culminated to the inclusion of the district in east pakistan led to one of the largest displacements the authenticity of the manner in in which the referendum was conducted was questioned and a sense of insecurity got instilled into the religious minorities it is to be mentioned that the state of assam already had a large number of bengali population both hindu and muslim even before march before the independence of india now significantly the issues of identity faced by the bengalis of northeast and of shoot of the partition and the subsequent disposition the pain the pain of being uprooted and the issues of resettlement have rarely been addressed in the bengali literature of assam in the first three decades following the partition of india this may be because of the fact that the uprooted and homeless destitute were so desperately engaged in their struggle for survival in a new land and so shattering and painful was their memory that they failed to distance themselves from their immediate context and needed some time to ponder over their fate and explore the themes in literary compositions in response to a question to uh, on the silence about the partition in bengali literature from northeast india uh, i uh, a renowned author from borak valley shamalandu chakraborty i asked him once he is now uh, no more i asked him that why uh, it happened so because he himself was a partition victim why there was no representation of partition in in his writing or the writings of the people till the 70s and he say we wanted to forget the pain and the scar however it was difficult to forget the scar is the bengali identity always remained at the crossroads facing constant challenges both covert and overt of multiple dimensions as has been mentioned the issues concerning immigration have determined the fates fates of several elections in assam media in assam has often been replete with reports of regular infiltration of bengali muslims through the porous border from east pakistan and even after the liberation of bangladesh the gradual increase of bengali population both hindus and muslims was often viewed as a threat to assamese language and culture particularly by a section of assamese intelligentsia and political leaders which became the center of debate mostly around censuses this is very important around censuses and elections in the state during such times charged with conflicting emotions and political maneuvering the enemy was identified in the other the who are the other the immigrants synonymous with bengali and the outbreak of the tension found expression through several agitations often violent in assam the asha movement that broke out in 1979 through mass agitation programs was largely a non violent initiative but the neeli massacre followed by a uh, bl bloodbath in gohpur witnessed and these two witnessed extreme form of uh, violence and bloodshed the alpha united liberation front of assam uh, abandoned uh, uh, abandoned uh, ter terrorist organization now 
was founded in 1979 to establish a sovereign Assam through armed struggle. The normal life in the state was completely disrupted for a long period. Several violent riots broke out between indigenous Bodos, Bodos and Bengali-speaking Muslims in Lower Assam. The last three decades of the 20th century was thus a period of extreme uncertainty, particularly for the Bengali, both linguistic and religious minorities. Consequently, a deep sense of despair crept in the minds of Bengali in Assam. The independence created a permanent scar in the minds as the migration following the partition of the country determined their identity which was put to test time and again and thus haunted them throughout the rest of their lives. Once uprooted, the apprehension of getting displaced once again created a crisis of identity not only amongst the immigrants but also the whole of Bengali community in Assam. In this context, the Bengali wedding cards, and this is very interesting, uh, in uh, Assam, the Bengali wedding cards invariably till 1970s used to have used to mention the uh, the family uh, lineage, the family lineage which invariably used to be Purbo Bongo. So in the family in the in the we wedding card, Adi Nibash was so important. But after the now these identity markers were displayed with pride and underlined one's nostalgic association with the land lost. However, such identity gradually became a burden as it, it made linguistic minority vulnerable in the politics of otherization. Significantly, such practices gradually disappeared after the Asha movement. If one of the reasons of the disappearance of such markers of migrant identity uh, was the apprehension of the impact of otherization. The other could also be the fact that the new generations of the partition victims were no longer ready to seek their identity in a distant past or a distant land that was in no way part of their living memory. Camouflaging one's cultural identity in the face of such otherization often is discerned particularly in the Brahmaputra Vedi of Assam in the use of Bengali surnames. So where children through affidavit sometimes change their parental surnames, surnames like Shen, Ghosh, Bosh, Ganguly, which are unmistakably uh, reveal a person's Bengali identity to surnames like Dash. So a Shen becomes Dash, Ghosh becomes Dokto, Bosh becomes uh, 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 maybe uh, Dash, and uh, Ganguly becomes Bhattacharya or Gushar which are common to both Assamese, uh, uh, means which are, uh, so they uh, take certain surnames, through F.E. David, change their surnames to certain surnames which are common both to Assamese and Bengali communities. The displacement and the further fear of dispossession destabilize any evolving sense of belonging and so a search of socio-cultural center ensured, ensured among the Bengali in Northeast. Significantly, Bengali literature of Assam, as I have already mentioned, till 1970, reveals a distinctive attempt to shape itself in the mold of Kolkata centric, a seemingly Beng mainstream Bengali literature. However, a discernible shift of focus can be perceived in the Bengali literature of Assam from the next decade. Instead of shying away from the immediate context and the burning issues of their day-to-day -day life and identity, it began to address the subjects integral to their existence and identity. The silver lining in the whole green scenario during the period of uncertainty in Assam was the gradual rise of protest and resistance from Assamese people who, along with a group of linguistic minority, began to express their voice against the politics of hatred and violence. Consequently, there grew an atmosphere of renewed hope, feeling of solidarity, and an emerging sense of belonging among the displaced. And I quote now, instead of turning their back from the problems being negotiated, Bengali literature of Assam began to address the issues related to the partition of India, the dislocation, 
the relocation, the marginal existence, the disturbed sense of belonging, the emergence of the sense of exile, and the consequent crisis of identity, and in the process, have succeeded in evolving a distinctive identity. Unquote. I quote, I have quoted from the book Barbed Wire Fence. The pang of dislocation and the crisis evolving out of the issues of identity provided creative impetus for, apart from poetry, mainly a good number of Bengali short stories and a few novels, which instead of depicting the bitter, harsh memories of violence, though deal, with, deal to some extent with the urge for longing and belonging to a paradise lost forever, negotiate largely with the issues of lease settlement, resettlements, and the tension arising out of the interface in a multicultural society where nationality and identity at every moment remain at stake. In this context, I'm visually uh, drawing conclusion, uh, means I'm coming to the uh, summing up uh, portion after I discuss, I briefly mentioned four short stories, which are very important for, uh, uh, for this uh, 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 means write-up. Now, in the context, in this context, I would like to discuss it in brief, as I told you, four Bengali short stories from Assam to explore certain uh, important facets integral to the evolution of Bengali identity in the Northeast. The first of the short story is Bomokesh Kabbotitthir Korcha by Omalendu Bhattacharya, who is a Kongwish ovation victim, a refugee Bengali Hindu Brahmin priest, who was compelled to migrate from an East, from an East Pakistan village, his an ancestral homeland, to Barak Valley of Assam just after the partition. The partition has caused havoc in the life of Bomokesh, the son of a relatively well-off Sanskrit teacher of Ponjo Kondo, once a seat of learning in East Pakistan. Faced with extreme financial constraints, watching helplessly a gradual erosion of traditional culture and values, and a disregard of Sanskrit language, which he regards highly, Bomokesh feels the pain of a dislocated who had been compelled to settle in a society where he is constantly reminded of his marginal existence and so longs for the days and the land he had to leave behind. The second story is Asraf Ali Shobesh by Moloy Kanti De, which represents the plight of a Bengali Muslim in the post Assam agitation period in the early 1980s, when a witch hunt for foreigners and deportation created havoc uh, in the lives of the Bengali people, a resident of a resident of Assam for last three decades, Asraf, had crossed the border in his childhood along with his parents after they had lost their ancestral homes to the land-hungry, wealthy Muslim uh, landowners. Even though he had <clears throat> exercised his franchise in several general elections in India, he never thought of acquiring a citizenship certificate, as he never knew that one needed to have a document in support of one's being an Indian citizen. Since Bangladesh government was not ready to accept the deported people from India, dispossessed beings like Asraf Ali are evicted under the cover of darkness by the state police and deserted to the, in the no man's land between India and Bangladesh. Standing in the no man's land, Asraf's little son asks his father when they could go back home. Displaced. Asraf has no answer as he does not have a no homeland now. The third short story is Chudhuri, and the story records the plight of Mohindro, a one of one of those brave Assami souls who had the courage to uphold sanity in an atmosphere charged with hatred and violence against the linguistic minority fostered by a section of politicians and intelligentsia. In his attempt to make the people see reason, Mohindro has antagonized a large section of his own community to such an extent that he is threatened and is called to leave and compelled to leave his village and seek shelter in Barak Valley. Here too, he watches a growing suspicion and division among the Bengalis, 
the Hindus and the Muslims. Mohindro receives, Mohindro is an Assamese. So Mohindro receives the news that his wife has given birth to a son in the village, village in Brahmaputra Valley. He decides to go back home against all odds to have a glimpse of his newborn baby. He arrives, he arrives home in the middle of night. However, the news of his arrival soon spreads throughout the village. He is attacked by a group of violent mob, exhausted from his arduous journey and illness. Mohendra flees, takes shelter in the house of a friend in a nearby village inhabited by Bengalis. The story ends as Mohendra's house is put to flame. While he is asleep, almost unconscious, unaware of the plight of the relatives of his relatives, his wife and his newborn baby. The last story, Ghum Bhanganiya, by Omitavo Dev Choudhury recreates <clears throat> the tension anguish, pain, pity, the crisis and the construction of identity of a Bengali in a very subdued tone. The narrator, a second generation of the refugee of the partition, comes across a homeless, impoverished, ugly old woman who had migrated to Assam several decades ago and provides her a shelter in a nearby temple. She compulsively talks about her past life in East Bengal of undivided India several decades ago and creates a spell in the mind of the narrator as he begins to feel nostalgic about whom he has only heard about a uh, heart from elderly people. The narrator is not sure whether the account of her past life is authentic as some of the stories told by the old woman contradict one another. The knocks of the old woman at his door wakes the narrator up every morning and he is forced to listen to her stories of the past. Often he feels irritated, but the more he listens to her stories, the more he feels that he is going back down to the collective memory lane of the Bengali and searches his identity in an imaginary homeland. One day the old woman, woman suddenly disappears. The narrator initially misses her absence dearly. With the passage of time, as he is almost on the verge of forgetting her, in an early morning, he hears a knock at the door. As he opens the door, no one stands before him. The rain-drenched cool morning bridge greets. Finally, he is awakened to the beauty and the charm of the nature of the land he lives in. The urge to go back down to the collective memory lane of the ex exile to the land of his ancestors, the imaginary homeland no longer haunts him anymore. Thus the four short stories discussed, as I have discussed here, are symptomatic to the issues of the evolution of Bengali identity in the post-independence Northeast India in general and Assam in particular. Like the Kolkata-centric Bengali literature, the partition narratives from Assam does not dwell much on the violence of the partition and the subsequent riots in East Bengal or East Pakistan, which ultimately necessitates the exodus. But unlike the former, which, and I quote, continue to nurture a nostalgic longing for the land they, shall, they still consider their own, their homeland or desh. But Bengali literature of, from Assam responds to the diverse facets and dimensions of the impact of the partition of India that had left a permanent impress on the life and identity of Bengali community in the region. The first of the four stories that is Bomokesh Kabbotil Terkorcha reflects the anguish and a sense of despair of a first generation victim of the partition who became immediate prey to the referendum of Silet and the partition on religious line that followed and had to leave their homeland out of duress. Bomokeshes were, Bomokeshe Ra, Bomokeshes were born and brought up in the pre-independence period in undivided India and after migration to independent India had to live with the pang and anguish of betrayal as their identity remained embedded in the longing for the land lost forever. The second story that is Asraf Ali Shodes depicts the plight or a section of poor Bengalis like Asraf who whose migration to India was under duress and in search of better economic possibilities. 
for such twice disposes displacement was something one under the threat of which they lived each and every moment of their lives <clears throat> they are literally and figuratively trapped in a no man's land with no home and no place to consider their own the third story that is agoon records the act of sanity human compassion and sense of solidarity in a volatile period in the state of assam which was charged with passion suspicion and hatred it reveals that resistance against fanaticism and violence marginalizes those who resist even though they belong to the majority community the story is significant because it reveals that the experience of dispossession is not limited to the linguistic or religious minority only it is also experienced by anyone who attempts to resist the agents of political uh, political power and hegemony people like mohendro stand against the forces of disintegration and are dispossessed and displaced however in the process they help in breaking the wall between the located and the dislocated because they could now locate their common enemy the last of the sto stories ghum bhanganiya records how a second generation displaced bengali gradually comes to terms with the environment around him he has only he has only read and heard about the traumatic experiences of the partition but he has the lived experience of a land which has gradually become to begun to reconcile itself to the multicultural and multilingual nature he does not nurture any more the memory of a land he does not belong to he no longer is afraid of dispossession as he has faith in the mohendros who would spread their hands towards the likes of him during any testing time because only through a uh, resistance against the forces of disintegration they can evolve a true multicultural state of existence he today does not need to trace his identity outside his state of domicile or seek a, a center elsewhere he is awakened to his multicultural multilingual and multi religious existence and knows that he is an integral part to that identity in fact the movement and the constant intermingling of varied population groups in the region have created a site of cultural interaction and interface on the other hand there have been conflicts over the control of land and resources these conflicts have thrown up questions of indigeneity territoriality ethnicity and identity which in their turn have found expression in the literary and cultural practices of the area on the other hand the such close mingling of cultures and the resultant cultural exchange have created a culture and literature that more often than not celebrates hybridity and furthers an ambivalent post colonial identity and in this crossroads is the evolution of bengali identity in assam and the northeast the trajectory of which particularly since the independence has been through a uh, an ongoing process of constriction and construction thank you so much over to ramanuj thank you so much uh, dr das uh, and you have uh, uh, spoken so many uh, uh, things uh, your observations were so necessary in today's time uh, and uh, when we were talking about uh, organizing this webinar and uh, i uh, uh, contacted you for this inverted lecture uh, we both of us agreed that we should talk about something that is is beyond bengali identity that is beyond bengali bhotlok identity in fact in my Uh, opinion the uh, bengali identity uh, beyond kolkata and bengali identity that has been so uh, uh, throughout this subcontinent such a way that uh, it it gives bengali 
ಮಲ್ಟಿ ಮಲ್ಟಿ ಲೇಯರ್ಡ್ ಡೈಮೆನ್ಶನ್ ಸೊ ವಿದೌಟ್ ಮಾರ್ಚ್ ಡೀಟೇಲ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಕೊನಿಕಾ ಮುಖರ್ಜಿ ಹಿಯರ್ ಶಿ ಆರ್ ಡಾಸ್ ಮೆಮೊರಿ ಪ್ಲೇ ಅನ್ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ರೋಲ್ ಇನ್ ಬೆಂಗಾಲಿ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಟಿ ಆಸ್ ವಿ ಸಿ ಇನ್ ದೋಟ್ರಿ ಆಫ್ ಜೀವನಾನಂದ ದಾಸ್ Yes, yes. Of course, this is very interesting. Thank you for your uh, observation. Now, I just uh, means, I, I agree to what you have said, but at the same time, uh, I uh, see, uh, I think uh, memory uh, probably is uh, part and parcel of uh, uh, every, uh, the identity of any, uh, every community, particularly if you have a very rich memory. If you have a, it is something like, uh, 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 if if you your uh, we often love to say that our uh, grandparents were jamindars so if it is something uh, larger than life and uh, uh, and it is if it is uh, if we have a rich heritage it is always uh, natural that you uh, seek a uh, seek your identity somewhere in the past so it is there in jivananda dash and of course uh, uh, means uh, the poetry and the literature of that period uh is very uh, this kind of nostalgia is there you have mentioned jivan dash that was a uh, and that is there that is a part and parcel of that i'm just i would like to draw your attention and another very in, uh, very interesting and significant uh, 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 fact you know uh, after the partition of india very uh, see uh, you must have uh, noticed that my presentation is rather uh, i i have uh, looked at the whole issue from the perspective uh, largely from the perspective of the subalterns because they are uh, because these people are the people who are in the margins have suffered the most in the partition of india and when we talk of bengali identity we tend to uh, uh, usually we tend to uh, exclude this group who actually form the largest group uh of uh, the bengalis so you we we probably cannot think of any any identity talk of any bengali identity without taking into our uh, uh, compass uh, the uh, all the uh, means uh, people belonging to different class and section uh, uh, and in different uh, 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 places now interestingly what i was uh, i i i wanted to uh, add here you see uh, i am associated with one project and where uh, it is on the uh, partition and the migration and its impact in in assam particularly southern assam now we have interviewed more than 350 people some of the, them are uh, have served in the uh, means in the detention camp uh, one person has already died one of them was uh, was 103 years old who was put to detention camp but then uh, his name is Chandrodhar Das so we have this experience now what happened what I wanted to relate here if you have ta- gone to Karbianglong district Gifu, nearby Gifu, the uh, means largest uh, town in that uh, district there are uh, a few villages who which are Bengali villages Bengali Hindu uh dwellers who had migrated from uh, uh east pakistan uh during the partition of india and jawaharlal nehru actually uh, helped them to settle in that place now there you will find if you go enter that those villages these are very poor people now because the uh, because uh, because they now see why because i'm i'm saying what they have done is that what they have they have done is that they, they the first thing they did was to establish a school a bengali school and in different houses poor people but in their in in different houses we visited and we found that the pictures of rovinath tagore then uh, rovinath thakur then the uh, pictures of ishwar chandra vidyasagar and elda means all these so these people are trying to now this is part of their identity it is also memory and also part and parcel of the identity and you see what uh, means what price they had to pay for this 
Now, since they have not been able to integrate with the people around them, that is the Karbi people, now these two or three villages are facing extreme kind of uh, isolation from any developmental project. So these are some of the some of the uh, some of the issues we which uh, uh, we do not uh, means usually we don't get to know. Thank you. Exactly, exactly. They they remain continuously marginalized even uh, uh, even by the academia. So here is yes. another question uh, by Shukhanoka Banerjee. Uh, uh, she is basically asking about the gender role. Uh, does gender play a role in the evolution of Bengali identity in the Northeast? And what about the women uh, authors and women writers? Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Uh, uh, there are uh, significant women writers. I can refer to one diary, Suprabha Dottir diary. The diary was written in the first half of uh, 19th century. I think if I'm not, uh, sorry, 20th century. It was written uh, between on uh, 1920 to 1935 and uh, interestingly this woman Suprabha Dotto was a housemaker and uh, she took part in in freedom struggle now her husband had given her a, a diary and asked her that if you want whatever you want to write you write there now you see this woman used to and uh, uh, not regularly and then uh, she died early and before his death her husband told his son that you please uh, you i i give it to you you do whatever you want to do with the diary now this diary was published now when this was published this was published this is available in the market in the name of suprabha dr diary what i did not like about it was that the diary was edited by the editor which should not have been done because they felt that certain uh, uh, certain <coughs> certain uh, 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 certain things are there in that uh, diary. Uh, certain uh, uh, which uh, probably have uh, created some kind of uh, issues in the uh, family. Uh, but then Suprabha Dotto, you see, you she know, had died. Uh, this is something. This is something okay. where I want to get in. The the editors are sometimes. Uh, can you hear me? The, the editors are sometimes they are the institutional gatekeepers. They are exactly. censoring things in a different way, exactly. uh, which is justifiable. Uh, uh, in many cases, people do justify such editing, but they are actually the institutional gatekeepers. They yes. are the censors. Yes. So, yes. so the, definitely, the, 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 since the, this is a testimonial, uh, this is a memoir, our, our first person experience uh, there should not be any scope for editing and censoring because exactly. the raw data would be even valuable yes yes now you see uh, means what happens means uh, uh, it is this diary uh, if uh, there are young scholars are there so i would ask them to find it means you may search this book and this is one of the uh, uh, Probably one of the uh, uh, means one of the uh, most significant uh, by any Bengali uh, woman uh, writing I have uh, read during uh, means of that of that uh, period. Another very important identity marker is Komala Bhattacharya. Komala Bhattacharya is one of those martyrs uh, of the Bhasha Shohid of the eleven Bhasha Shohid. She was a young girl at that time. Now you see this Komala. Bhattacharya, who uh, is one of those 11 shohits or the martyrs, language martyrs of 1961. Now, this, uh, now in the formation of identity, there are plenty. There are uh, means poets, there are a large number of poets. Now, there are certain uh, uh, organizations which are completely controlled by women. There, uh, there are literary organizations, there are other kind of uh, socio-cultural organizations which are controlled by uh, uh, women. So, of course, women, uh, yes, as you are saying, the gender rule, even though I have not studied in a separate manner, uh, be, uh, but then, in a, but then, of course, there is a, uh, there is enough scope for study uh, because uh, there are, uh, there are quite a few uh, significant poets and then also 
uh, fictional writers and non-fictional writers too who have come up and who have uh, contributed to a great extent uh, towards the formation of this identity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And and is there anyone uh, who wants to turn uh, his or her mic on and ask something? To yes, to may, may I may I uh, uh, may I ask him a question? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dash. This is Antara Mukherjee. Um, I have had the good fortune of uh, listening to you in uh, in one of my refresher courses at Bardwell University, okay. and uh, uh, it was uh, as pleasurable as it was. Now, uh, in a very interesting and engrossing lecture, Dr. Dash, uh, I am just curious to know, since you are an acclaimed translator, as I know, uh, how far Bengali literature of Assam on partition has been mm -hmm. successful in preserving subaltern cultural practices as markers of Bengali identity? I mean, are there any references to uh, Bengali cuisine or something like that? Because we do leave behind uh, a whole lot of our being when we are migrating from one space to another space. Yeah, you see, it's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, very interesting because I think there are there are lot of possibilities for research work on this because there are. But then the thing is that people have people usually go for go for the stereotypes people for even for research work. What you have mentioned is very interesting, and this brings me to one uh, particular. Uh, this is also uh, a collection of letters. Uh, actually, a housewife, a housewife, she uh, <clears throat> died, uh, uh, expired maybe uh, ten years uh, ago, around ten years ago. Now, when she was married to, she was from uh, Srihatto. Okay, she was from Srihatto. She was married to. A uh, uh, Jamindar, a landlord of of Kachar. Now you know there are uh, there are uh, undercurrent of tension between uh, there was at least Silites and the people of Kachar. Okay. Now if you now she used to write letters to her uh, mother and she used to give those letters to her husband to post them. The husband didn't post any of the letters because there used to be a lot of complaints about uh, uh, about the husband even. Now, husband before his death, this is also interesting, like the earlier one, Shukrava Dr. Diary, which I told you. Uh, this uh, a lady used to write uh, occasional letters to her mother, and there used to be a lot of complaint even uh, about the husband. And the husband never posted any, any letter. But then before his death, he handed over the letters to his son. Okay. Now, son had published, and this time, for me, fortunately, unedited. Okay. And in this Okay, now this is very interesting. What happens is that in one place she is, uh, she's talking about the language, use of the language. She is saying, Jano ma, ora ekhane lauke kodu bole. Okay, in, in Kachar, ora lauke kodu bole. And, and she also says that uh, je, uh, last goto, goto, shaddin dhore ami shurjor alo, alo dekhini jomudar, jomudar barite ami, mane, she used to move, move uh, open on the uh, uh, means in the uh, road of our village in uh, Sihoto. But then coming uh, to here in the Jomidar Badi, she Marcos Kopi Pani Shino Duare by Reja. What you are saying about the cuisine and all this, and of course, these are this must be there. I have not explained uh, all because so there are quite good amount of research materials only uh, since it is a, I'm, I'm very happy that it's a, it's a webinar on young research scholars so if anyone is uh, interested i I'm, I'm there uh, uh, to 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 help you to uh, to collect uh, in the collection of your uh, means i can at least add sources and i can give you some some clue for getting the resources you may do your work in any university under any supervisor, but then this is something which I can uh, help you uh, doing it because we, I really, honestly, I believe that we have not yet been able to, we, I mean, all Bengalis, we have not been able to write a history of the Bengali identity, on Bengali identity, 
or we have not yet been able to write Bangalit Itihash Ekono Laka from Puno Itihash Ekono Laka Hari. Itihash Laka Bodu Juru. That's what I think. Thank you so much. I mean, this using thing interests me because I personally, you know, I, I one of my colleagues was from Silet. He, he grew up over there and then he, you know, migrated to uh, Chandranagar where actually I'm also leaving. And every time I used to visit his house, he used to offer me a plate saying that this could be alu posto, but this is a different type of alu posto. Okay, <laughs> this is this has this touch of, you know, Assam, this touch of Shilong yeah. and, and all these things. So yeah, I always I think that we don't need to yeah. be, you know, have this history of violence and partition is, is a yeah. separate thing, but there are other stuff also which goes uh, with this yeah. migration. Food, food item. You see, when I go to, I, I've been to Silet. I've been to Silet to different, uh, uh, I, I, uh, been to, uh, Poncho Kondo. I, I went to Dhaka Dokin. Dhaka Dokin is the ancestral home, homeland of, uh, uh Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So I went to Dhaka Dokin. And they are in the I I saw because means the food uh, there are these are very interesting because Sileti people rarely use sweet in their sugar sugar in their any kind of uh, uh, means uh, uh, preparations apart from paish and other things. And mishti chada onno ki chute traditional Sileti. But then here, after the migration, uh, even the the food uh, the preparation of food has changed the Greek. A uh, big, big way, but then we also have to keep in mind that uh, almost uh, more than sixty percent of the people of Borak Valley have not been are not migrated people. They were here because Borak Valley was part and parcel of Assam even in the pre-independence period, and people were here. So it's something. It was it's a, it was a uh, part of the larger Bengal. Uh, it's a different story probably uh, uh, because. Uh, the border of Assam was dissected several times. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And and we uh, do not have time probably anymore, but uh, uh, still one more since we, we had some technical glitches at the beginning uh, of the day uh, to today's session. So uh, one more mic on question if anyone wants to. Uh, Hello. Hello. No. There, there is a jarring noise coming from your side. I mean, the, the instead of the voice, I mean, we just we are not getting. Can you hear me now, sir? No, no, we cannot hear it. Okay. Turn it off and then turn it on. Okay. So, yeah. You might leave and come back as my Okay. Thank you. Uh, just, uh, I mean, just uh, you have to just leave this platform and, and come back again. Okay. That might help. Just a second, sir. Anyone else? Uh, we have uh, we have a couple of minutes time. If there is nobody, then can I ask uh, one question on his story, uh, which I have read? If there, or I, or I can uh, pass it back on to others. So that's entirely up to the convener. Uh, I mean, uh, if there is anyone else, I. Uh, or, or we might close this session altogether uh, because uh, we were supposed to start business session three at five, uh, but because it started with technical glitches and we wasted some time in the beginning. So I thought uh, uh, maybe. I think uh, I think somebody I think else there was. There were yeah. like I think uh, uh, Abhin Chakraborty was trying to ask. Yes, I was wondering about uh, the Bengali community in Shillong. Uh, when I went there last time, I uh, met a few Bengalis and uh, 
many of them were lamenting about the fact that uh, bengali identity from the cityscape of shillong is uh, gradually being erased even though uh, a while back a few years back it was very much a vibrant part of the cityscape of shillong yes it is true it is true because uh, bengali was the uh, after the <clears throat> local people the bengali was the largest community in uh, shillong uh, some maybe uh, some uh, 30 years uh, ago but now it is the fourth uh, largest bengalis uh, large number of bengalis have sold out their properties and uh, and you probably know that after uh, meghalaya became a state uh, means pe- uh, non tribal people cannot sell property a uh, property uh, and they cannot sell uh, sorry they they cannot sell property to uh, non tribal people so it should be sold to the uh, tribal people only so people have taken different other uh, measures for uh, selling to non tribal people something like uh, giving gift and all these things so this legal uh, uh, means hassles are uh, uh, negotiated through different means but uh, it's, it's true shillong actually was the cultural center of bengali cultural center of northeast before uh, uh, means uh, before uh, the 80s uh, shillong was very culturally vibrant you know the tagore connection and all that so there were uh, very uh, means excellent uh, singers from shillong and you know in uh, indian idol a uh, boy from some some years back uh, omit something uh, from shillong uh, he uh, became uh, uh, indian idol and then you know another thing uh, probably some of you must have read uh, novels of siddhartha dev siddhartha dev of the point of return of surface uh, who uh, now in most probably california and he has come up with uh, non fictional prose also he's a very prominent indian english writer if you have not read him please read uh, the point of return it is on the in the written in the context of uh, identity uh, uh, crisis of the bengalis in in uh, uh, the northeast now siddhartha dev also hails from uh, meghalaya from uh, shillong his uh, father was a was a uh, was in the most probably the ag so, Yes, I, I, I agree. Uh, but then one thing which I, I feel there are many, 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 many issues. Uh, probably in one uh, main talk that cannot be, uh, you cannot take up uh, all the issues. It's a very complex kind of uh, thing, and there are multiple issues. Uh, who can some other occasions will take up uh, some other issues. But then what you have said is true. I, I agree to what you. Have. Yes, thank you, Dr. Das, so much. Because you agreed to uh, uh, spend your time with us, your valuable time, and uh, uh, we really had uh, a really enriching session. Your lecture uh, was so important and so necessary for this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank now, you. We, now we move on to uh, the business session three, which is the first business session of day two, uh, and this session will be chaired by Dr. Pradeep Tosham Choudhury, who is assistant professor of English at the University of North Bengal, and he is also um, uh, one of the members uh, uh, in the editorial advisory board of this journal. The paper presenters uh, in this session are. Uh, Shemunti Nondi, Dhrushita <coughs> De, Mohana Chatterjee, and Mohammad Nahid Kamal. So, uh, Pradeep To Sham Choudhury, Doctor Sham Choudhury, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, all of you, and I'm very much happy and. I feel lucky to be a part of this seminar. Now, I think we should uh, straight away uh, go to the main uh, presentation. And as uh, Brahmanujda has said, we have four paper presenters here: Shemonti Nondi, Devashita Dev, Mohana Chakiji, 
and Muhammad Nahid Kamal. Uh, are you all present? I think uh, all of them are present. So yes, sir. I am present. Okay, Mohana. Mohana yes, uh, sir. I am Shemti Nundi. I'm also present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can see Vidashita Dev and uh, Nahid Kamal. Uh, Okay. Um, sir, I'm also present. The bus okay, okay, okay. Now, before uh, we start the session, I'll, uh, I would like to sh say that four of the paper presenters will be given 12 minutes time. Is it okay with you? 12 minutes? Yes, I think 12 minutes would be better. Otherwise, uh, we were supposed to give them 15 minutes, but, but uh, 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 since... We are running out of time. We are already running late, so uh, so okay. Then we will ask you all minutes, and after ten minutes, I'll uh, just give you a warning. But don't take it as a very strong warning or something. Just I'll request you to wind up your discussion. So we will have all the presentations uh, first. After that, we will open all the four papers for questions and discussions and interactions. So uh, let's start. I would like to request Shemonti Nondi, who will speak on embattled bodies revisiting the Birangonas of Bangladesh. Shemonti Nondi. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I being audible? Yeah, you're audible. Okay. You're audible. Yes. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I'm Shemunti Nondi and I am an EMPHIL scholar, a research scholar in the Department of English under the University of Calcutta. And uh, like I'll straight away go, uh, to go over, over to my paper. But before that, I'll just need one moment to uh, share my screen. Yes. So, uh, is my screen being visible? Yeah, it's visible. Okay. It's visible. So, yeah. So, I begin with my paper. So, as you can see, my paper is titled as Embattled Bodies Revisiting the Birangonas of Bangladesh. The appropriation of women's bodies as a symbol of victorious conquest has persisted as a predominant feature of wartime violence. Since peace time, while peacetime assault is considered a crime against a woman, wartime sexual assaults on women are often discounted as routine acts indulged in by the combatants. During times of conflict, women's bodies are often turned into objects of symbolic exchange between warring parties. According to Joan Nagel, women occupy a distinctly symbolic role within the nationalist discourse as biological producers of ethnic collectivities and as ideological transmitters of cultural normativity. Thus, in the landscape of warfare, preaching women's dignity through bodily violation is strategically employed by the enemy forces for intimidating and humiliating their opponents and vandalizing the nation at large. The Bangladesh Liberation War of 1971, which spawned the sovereign nation state of Bangladesh, was no exception. The catastrophic warfare that ensued between West Pakistan and its eastern wing, owing to the latter's demand for secession, occasioned extreme form of gendered violence. Martial rape was systematically employed for crushing the descent of the East Pakistani Bengalis, uh, an ethnic group which included both Hindus and Muslims, whereby thousands of women were sexually violated and ruthlessly slaughtered by the West Pakistani militia and their local collaborators called the Razakars. Besides targeting them as metonymic embodiments of their communities, whose defilement would bring shame upon the entire ethnic group, West Pakistan also identified Bengali Muslim, Bengali speaking Muslim women as potential fecund bodies whose wombs could be appropriated for perpetuating genetic imperialism and for symbolically converting East Pakistan by gendering true Muslims. The aim of such coerced impregnation was to bring about intergenerational defilement and undermine national, political and cultural so solidarity by confusing the identity and loyalty of the next generation. Thus, within a span of nine months of the Bangladeshi freedom struggle, a, strag a staggering number of 200,000 of women were raped and impregnated by Pakistani soldiers, with many of them being even incarcerated in army camps as sex slaves. However, after the liberation war, these women were welcomed back by the government of Bangladesh, which, in an unprecedentedly progressive stance, conferred upon the rape survivors the honorific of Birangona, or war heroine, in order to prevent them from being socially 
sexually ostracized and attempted to rehabilitate them by marrying them off or providing them with government jobs and vocational training. However, the, the state policy of launching various socio-economic programs for rehabilitating and reinstating the Birangonas into the rubric of the mainstream society was only partially successful as most of the rape survivors were confronted with disapprobation and ostracization within their own communities. The lives of the Birangonas in post-1971 Bangladesh have evolved in diverse ways under the current of multifarious socio-political developments. The aim of my paper is to interrogate the identity of the Birangona as it has been examined by Noyonika Mukherjee and Najmur Nahar Kia in their graphic novel Birangona towards ethical testimonies of sexual violence during conflict. I intend to locate the figure of the Birangona as one which occupies pluralistic spaces of identity in contrast to her generic discursive representation as a mute and disempowered victim. Such a nuanced approach to, to decoding the subjectivities of the Birangona seems integral for arriving at a consummate understanding of the impact of genocidal rape in the individual lives of the survivors. My literary choice of Mukherjee and Kia's text is primarily guided by the fact that it astutely employs the genre of the graphic novel to provide insights into the social and political subtexts that are entwined in the narratives of the Birangona. The graphic novel not only sheds light on the complexities of the identity politics of the Birangona women, but also sets up a paradigm for conducting interviews on victims of sexual violence without essentializing them into a spectacle. Furthermore, the graphic novel seems to deliberately employ simplified panels where the in interplay of text and illustrations is used to propel the narrative, thereby ensuring its appeal to a larger audience beyond the boundaries of language. The textual narrative revolves around a 12-year-old schoolgirl, Labunno, and her interactions with her maternal grandmother, Rehana, and her mother, Hena, whose assistance she seeks for completing her school project of chronicling family memories of 1971. While recounting the details of Bangladeshi liberation struggle, Labunno's grandmother also acquaints her with the figure of the Birangona. The very fact that Labunno school history books did do not mention the war heroines of Bangladesh, except cursorily commenting that, quote, the honor of 200,000 mothers and sisters have been lost, unquote, comes as a glaring pointer to the way the existence of the Birangonas have been largely gl glossed over by the hegemonic meta-narratives of official history. Labunno's grandmother informs her that not only were the wartime survivors of 1971 accorded the honorific of the Birangona, but also the government of Bangladesh under Sheikh Mujibur Rahman set up rehabilitation centers where the victims of coerced impregnation underwent abortion and war babies were put up for international adoption. Government ventures like marrying off the Birangonas or providing them with marketable skills were all oriented towards reinstating these rape survivors into the mainstream society. However, the reverence and sympathy that was manifested towards the Birangona women by the new nation state was not reflected even remotely in the hostile attitudes of their families and communities where they were mostly shunned and shamed for their desecration. In an Islamic nation like Bangladesh, where female chastity and virginity were looked upon as premium markers of feminine virtue, the bodily defilement of the Birangona was equated with the soiling of her ijot or honor, thereby exposing them to verbal scorns and slurs such as borangona, which is a Bengali term for a loose woman or prostitute. Thus, reeling un reeling under the burden of social stigma and familial rejection, many of the wartime rape victims committed suicide, while several others became mute under, a, under an overwhelming sense of shame. Such a description of the Birangona makes young Labunno reminiscent of the hair photograph by Naimuddin Ahmed, which is preserved in the Liberation War Museum of Bangladesh as a visual trace of the rape survivor of 1971. The photograph, which depicts the war heroine in her loose, disheveled hair and bangle-clad fists covering her face, powerfully resonates with the generic image of the brutalized Birangona as a mute and disempowered victim. However, such an idea of the Birangona is contradicted by Labonno's mother, Hena, who, being a part of the ongoing oral history project, crucially intervenes at this juncture to share her experiences of collecting testimonies of rape survivors of 1971. Departing from the common assumptions, 
departing from the common assumptions about the lives of the Birangonas in post-conflict Bangladesh, Hena reports that not all Birangonas were rendered outcasts by their family and society, and many of them still live with their husbands and extended families, while a few of them have even held government jobs. Hena also tells Hena also tells Labunno that many of the Birangonas already have their names enlisted in the government government's official gazette courtesy the oral history projects that have been persistently conducted since the 1990s and some of them have started receiving monthly pensions since 2015 after the legislative bill that was passed on 29 January 2015 mandated the acknowledgement of the Birangonas as freedom fighters. She also mentions the diverse lives of the famous uh, sculptor Firdausi Priyobashini and Moina Karim, uh, Shirin Ahmed and Chayarani Dotto, all of whom were sexually assaulted during the 1971 liberation struggle. While the former two have been bold, while the former two have been bold enough to articulate their experience of wartime violence at public platforms, Shirin Ahmed, who suffered rape and consequent miscarriage during the war, has now developed a professional identity as a government employee, whereas Chayarani Dotto, who is a mother to a war child, has been compelled to, to the life of a sex worker. Thus, it is imperative to acknowledge that genocidal atrocities have impacted the lives of the Birangonas in myriad ways, and it would be myopic to read their identities as monolithic. During the course of this discussion, Labonno comes to learn about a family secret, that her grandmother Rehana herself is a Birangona. But Rehana consoles a crestfallen Labonno by stating that her identity is not, delim is not delimited to that of a rape victim, but rather her subjectivity is a palimpsest of the pluralistic identities such as that of a mother, a grandmother, and a retired government worker. Hence, it is important to accommodate the subjectivity of the Birangona in its multiplicity without relegating her to the generic category of a victim. Thus, the graphic novel comes up with a sharp critique of the predominant tendency to read the lives of the rape survivors as one frozen in time and treat them as fossilized vestiges of genocidal violence, which inadvertently ends up in dehumanizing the Birangona and reducing her to a spectacle of gendered oppression. Therein lies the need, as the text claims, of setting up new paradigms of collecting testimony from such survivors of sexual violence, which would not only include a more sensitive approach to the Birangonas, but will, would also involve the ethics of recording their narratives with fidelity, rather than trying to sensationalize their tales to exaggerate the horrors of their wartime experiences. The interviews should also be alert as not to jeopardize the socio-cultural position of the Birangonas and treat these women with empathy and compassion, helping, to cul helping them to cultivate a sense of honor in their wartime sacrifices. Such an approach will encourage the Birangonas who are now fast withering away with time, come forward with their accounts of sexual violence without any sense of discomfiture or indignity. This will not only pave the way for sensitizing the world to, uh, to, to the nuanced identities of the Birangona, but will also enable the nation state of Bangladesh to arrive at a more comprehensive idea about its own national identity. Last but not the least, the graphic novel brilliantly puts forward the idea of enlightening the younger generation of Bangladesh about their national history, wherein the figure of the Birangona features not as an essentialized spectacle, but as a resilient survivor of physical and psychological assaults, whose contribution towards the birth of sovereign Bangladesh can never be negated. Thank you. Thank you, Shemanti. Uh, the in topic is very interesting. Now, we move on to Devash Dev. Devash yeah. Dev. Yes, sir. Called, the other Bengalis in Assam, linguistic nationalism and the language movement of 1960. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, you are audible. Okay. You are audible. Okay. Uh, so uh, I'm diving right into the paper. The topic that I shall be exploring is the Bengalis, the other Bengalis in Assam, linguistic nationalism and the language movement of 1961. 
So I will first begin by discussing why I call the Bengalis in Assam the others. Now, the Bengalis in Assam are essentially the Silhetis, uh, who are an ethno-linguistic group native to Silhet region, speaking in Silheti language, which is quite distinct from the regular Bang Bengali language, which is spoken across Bengal. They are primarily concentrated in Barak Valley region of southern Assam, the districts of Hailakandi and Kachar from Arsval Surma Valley and Karimganj from Arsval Silhet constitute present day Barak Valley, which historically has been a Bengali majority region. The Silhetis have a very peripheral existence uh, in terms of the mainstream Bengali linguistic existence. Now, Silhet, which now belongs to uh, Bangladesh, was originally known as Srihattu, and during the colonial period, it was constantly aligned and realigned between Bengal, Bengal and Assam by the Britishers due to administrative reason. It was historically a part of undivided Bengal and a frontier region of British India until in 1874 when it was joined along with Kachar, another Bengali-speaking region of the Bengal Presidency, to the newly acquired territory of British Assam. In fact, the motivation for clubbing Silhet and Kachar with the newly carved out Chief Commissioner's Province of Assam was primarily to increase revenue and make Assam an economically viable province. The integration of Silhet with Assam was resisted vociferously by the Silhetis of the region because they were alienated from their cultural and linguistic continuity and constantly demanded to be returned to an advanced Bengal rather than be clubbed with Assam. The Assamese elite, on the other hand, who saw the English educated Bengalis as the main competitors for, for employment and as being responsible for inflicting a cultural hegemony in the region, also opposed this move. In 1905, when Bengal was partitioned into two, Silhet was made part of East Bengal and Assam, and in 1912 again, it was disintegrated from Bengal and made part of Assam. When the partition plan was drawn up in the wake of the independence of India and the question of how regions with mixed populations of Hindus and Muslims would be organized cropped up. The Assam Pradesh Congress Committee and the then Prime Minister of Assam as the head of the province was known as in under the British Raj, Sri Gopinath Bordoloi, played an important role in persuading the colonial government to transfer Silet to the dominion of Pakistan. In this regard, I would specifically mention about the manifesto released by the Assam Pradesh Congress Committee in 1945 that spoke spoke of the need for a culturally homogeneous Assam, and I quote it, unless the province of Assam is organized on the basis of Assamese language and culture, the survival of the Assamese nationality and culture will become impossible. The, the inclusion of Bengali-speaking Silhet and Kachar and immigration or importation of lakhs of Bengali settlers on wastelands has been threatening to destroy the distinctiveness of Assam and has, in practice, caused many disorders in administration. In 1946, Gopinath Bordoli told a British delegation, the Simon Commission, which had come to India to discuss the transfer of power, that Assam would be quite prepared to hand over Silhet to Pakistan. Against this backdrop, historian Sujit Chaudhary remarked, and I quote him, the Bengali-speaking district was regarded as an ulcer hindering the emergence of a unilingual Assam. Hence, when the decision for the referendum was announced, Gopinath Bordoloi conveyed to all concerned that the cabinet was not interested in retaining Silhet. Historian Omolindu Guho too noted that it was indeed the lifetime opportunity for the Assamese leadership to get rid of Silhet and carve out a linguistically more homogeneous province. As a result of this, on July 1947, moments before India attained independence, a referendum was held in Silhet to decide whether it would remain in Assam and join the new country of India or join the province of East Pakistan in the new country of uh, East Pakistan in the new country of Pakistan. The referendum was decided in favor of joining Pakistan. However, scholars like J.B. Bhattacharya have mentioned that there is sufficient controversy regarding the select referendum because 100,000 voters, most of whom were plantation workers, um, did, were, did not vote owing to the intimidating threats from the Muslim League. Now, following the referendum, most of Silhet, barring only the three and a half thanas of Patharkanti, Badarpur, Ratabadi, and Kuringmanj, were transferred to East Pakistan. In fact, the Silhet referendum was not just a partition of land, rather a partition of hearts and emotions. In course of my interaction with many first generation uh, first generation survivors of the partition, uh, many still hold the view that had the tea, tea garden uh, workers been allowed to vote, Deshbhag would not would have never really happened. In this regard, I would also like to point out about the uh, the religious composition of uh, of of the province of Silhet. Silhet, which had which had a majority Bengali speaking Muslim population, wanted to secede to undivided Pakistan, as it was an Islamic majority country. While the Silheti Hindu Bengal Silheti Hindus, a numerical minority in Silhet wanted to stay back in Assam. However, the results of the referendum sealed their fate and rendered them homeless. 
The disintegration of Siletro Assam came as what historian Shujit Chaudhary has called a godsend opportunity for the Assamese elite who had been craving for a linguistically homogenous province for themselves. Addressing the Assam Assembly soon after the independence on behalf of the Congress government in September 1947, the governor of Assam said, and I quote him, the natives of Assam are now masters of their own house. They have a government which is both responsive and responsible to them. The Bengali no longer has the power even if he had the will to impose anything on the people of these hills and valleys which constitute Assam. However, the euphoria of the Assamese elite was short-lived because the Sileti Hindus started migrating to Assam in large numbers soon after the partition, after being victims of religious persecution, leaving behind their Bhite, Mati and Desh with only their language and uh, culture to hold on to in their newfound homes. However, despite pressure from the center to accommodate these refugees, the Bordolay government refused to grant land land settlement to not only the refugees, but to all the non assamese communities who may have lived in Assam for several generations. In the wake of these, several commentators have blamed the Assam government for this hostile attitude towards retaining Silet, an allegation that played a bitter part in bengali assamese relations in post-1947 period. Thus, the permanent mark of partition also constructed the identification marker of the refugee with the Sileti Hindus. The partition of Silet and the associated migration of these people to Assam, where they have not yet been fully accepted as the antipathy towards the Bengalis, identified as the others, outsiders, Bidehis and Bangladeshis, could be witnessed throughout the 1950s, 60s, 70s and 80s in the form of senseless violence like the Bongal Khedha, Bideshi Khedha Andolon, language movement, Goreshwar killings, Assam agitation and the infamous Nelly Massacre, which saw merciless violence and killings of numerable, innumerable Bengalis in the state. Now, keeping this as the backdrop of this discussion, I move on to discussing the birth of linguistic nationalism in post-colonial Assam and the language movement of 1961. In post-independent Assam, the provincial government, headed by Sri Gopinath Bordolui, introduced a chain of language policies, by, and it clearly pronounced its intention of restoring for the Assamese language the position of supremacy. The Bordolui government initiated the process of linguistic nationalism or Assamization by releasing a series of circulars forcing Assamese as the medium of instruction, as well as withholding aids to those schools that refused to follow the rules in the sphere of education by even withholding merit scholarships from non SME students, as he clearly pronounced in the Assam Assembly of 1948 that it is not the intention of the government to make Assam a bilingual state. The hegemonic linguistic nationalism sponsored and propagated by the Assamese provincial state was primarily pitched vis a vis the Bengali language and Bengali is the largest linguistic minority despite the exclusion of Silhet of the province. Thus, Udoyan Mishra aptly points Assamese linguistic nationalism left little space for other nationalities of the region. The politics Critics of othering, especially on the issue of linguistic identity, compel the Silhetis to bear, the, bear another facet of otherization. Now, if we consider the political and administrative scenario of post-colonial India around the same time, we will notice that soon after independence, India was faced with a humongous task of defining the territorial boundaries of the states, especially since it had a diverse character. By 1952, the demand for the creation of a Telugu-majority state in parts of Madras had become powerful, and after the fast unto death by Putti Sridamulu, one of the activists demanding the formation of Telugu-majority state, uh, resulted in the formation of Andhra state in 1953. This sparked of agitations all across the country with linguistic groups demanding separate statehoods and accordingly, the State's Reorganization Commission was constituted by the central government in 1953 to recommend the reor reorganization of state boundaries based on the major linguistic groups or population analyzed through the census data of 1951 residing in those particular provinces. And this report was received by the government in 1955. And in one of the provision of the SRC report was also to allow the use of majority language of the state as the official state language besides the use of English. Now, in this regard, I would like to mention a particular case in Assam that many immigrant Bengali Muslims from Moimon Shing, Rongpur of East Bengal, who were brought in by the Britishers to work as plantation laborers, now known as the No Ohomias, had listed their mother tongue as Assamese instead of Bengali in the 1951 census, thus resulting in a spike in the number of Assamese speakers from the 1931 census, which helped significantly in establishing the linguistic dominance of the Assamese. In this regards, KM Sharma states, just before the census of 1951, there were anti-Muslim riots in 1950, which killed innumerable Bengali Muslims in the state. Hence, the fear that the language would result either in their deaths or displacement, the Bengali Muslims in their region forcefully accepted Assamese as their mother tongue. Now, based on the Commission's recommendation, Parliament created the state of Assam in 1956. 
However, prior to the SRC, the State's Reorganization Commission, the Linguistic Provinces Commission, also known as the Dhar Commission, was appointed by uh, the Constituent Assembly in 1948 to consider the issue of linguistic provinces. The Dhar Commission described the demand for linguistic provinces as a form of parochial patriotism. The Commission noted that reorganization uh, of the states, reorganizing the states on linguistic grounds, posed a number of risks. Rather than dampening the subnational sentiment, it would fuel subnational bias, leading the subnation to regard both the minority living in the province as not their own, and this would be the death knell of Indian nationalism. The decision for reorganization of post-colonial states of India based on common language spoken by the majority linguistic populace in those states to make them socially homogeneous has in reality submerged the heterogeneity that characterizes the nation and the subsequent birth of the narrative of, of Assam for Assamese, Telangana for Telugus, Gujarat for Gujaratis has invisibilized the linguistic minorities and has simultaneously produced minority languages with respect to their status in these states. The Barak Valley case serves as a unique example as it emerged from such a context and is therefore quite different from the language-based mobilizations that dominate the academic discourse. Moreover, the Dhar Commission also pointed out that the acceptance of the principle of linguistic provinces would lead many other smaller linguistic groups to advance similar claims, which would set the ball rolling for the disintegration of the entire country. Thus, the 1948 report also noted that if India is to live, there simply cannot be an autonomous state anywhere in India for any group, linguistic or otherwise, and no subnational province can be formed without preparing the way for ultimate disaster. The earliest, the clearest manifestation of this viewpoint could be found in Assam, where in 1960, the Assam government passed the Official Language Act, making Assamese the only official state language other than English. And the chronology leading up to the fateful day commenced in 1960 when Bimala, Bimala Prashad Chaliho, the then Chief Minister of Assam, presented a bill in the State Assembly seeking to declare Assamese as the sole official language of the state. The bill was opposed by Ronindra Mohandas, the legislator from, the legislator from Karim Ganj, on the ground that it was tantamount to imposing Especially the language. need to wind up. Uh, okay, sir, just, just two minutes more. Okay, just two stop. minutes more. Yeah, almost done. Yeah, uh, on the ground that it was tantamount to imposing the language of one third on the rest of the population and is likely to affect their employment uh, pro prospects. Since apart from the Bengalis, ethnic groups from modern day states of Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Mizoram, Manipur, Meghalaya were also part of Assam. While the controversial bill was passed, it added fuel to fire. Bengal Khedha erupted once again in Brahmaputra Valley, leading to a gruesome massacre of Bengali Hindus in Goreshwar of Kamloop district. In fact, after the partition riots, the next major ethnic conflagration in Assam occurred during the language movement. The people of Deed and Kachar went all out in protest against this act, the provisions of which they felt would rightly deprive them of their legitimate linguistic right. They waged a movement of their own known as the Bhasha Andolan, which was started under the banner of Kachar Ganeshangram Purishot to include Bengali also as an official language and give similar recognition to other ethnic languages. It was a mass upsurge and the chauvinist Assam government came down heavily on the democratic movement in a violent way. On 14th of April 1961, Shankalpo Dibosh, Determination Day, was observed, leading to a mass-scale movement also joined by non-Bengali linguistic groups like the Manipuris. However, situation went to a grave pass when on 19th May 1961, the Assam Rifles openly fired the unarmed protesters who were observing Sottogroho in the Shilchar railway station that left 11 people dead, most of whom were born in Silhet. They quoted death in the love of their mother tongue, and one among them was also a teenage woman, Komala Bhattacharjo, incidentally, who was also the first woman language martyr of the world. This led to massive protests in Kachar, neighboring Tripura and West Bengal, especially in Kolkata, Moidan, and Shubod Molik Square, which erupted in mass protests. Non-Bengali linguistic groups such as Khasis of Shillong also took part in the protest. Legendary freedom fighter Ullashkar Dotto sent a bouquet to each of the language martyrs. In the face of more intensified democratic agitation, aided by popular support from all over the country, the Assam government, under unrelenting pressure, had to ultimately withdraw the circular, and Bengali was given the official state in the whole of Kachar district as per section 5 of the Assam Act of 1961. Now, as a long-term effect of this movement, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram and Meghalaya ultimately achieved statehood. I would like to conclude by saying that the 19th day of May or the language movement of Assam which is an event which has had a near total eclipse from the mainstream discourses on the history of language-based mobilization in independent India and elsewhere across the world, uh, opens up new complexities beyond the typical discourse that sees it only through the narrow prism of Assamese Bengali uh, confrontation. It provides a critical understanding that in a cosmopolitan nation like India, linguistic standardization and forceful linguistic homogenization, especially with the recent attempts to assertively recast the linguistic nationalism as an extension of Indian nationalism, produced in the Hindi heartland can often lead to a crisis of belonging for the marginalized, thus acting as an impediment to the realization of the Indian ethos of unity in diversity. Thank you for giving me a patient hearing.
thank you thank you devashrita yeah. thank you sir that was a wonderful presentation and the topic that we have taken up that is also a very potent area thank you sir now it's time for mohana chatterjee now yes, mohana sir. speak on yeah mohana you are there now mohana yeah. will speak on traveling memories and reformed identities a rereading athir vishash deshbhage smriti in light of the partition of bengal okay very interesting now it's time for mohana thank you very much sir i hope i am audible yeah you are audible so is my screen visible yeah your screen is also visible okay so i begin and my topic of presentation today is traveling memories and reformed identities rereading adhir vishash's deshbhage smriti in the light of the partition of bengal i uh, would like to start with the point that sidil radcliffe who was the chairman of the boundary commission had less than 2 months time to separate india and pakistan a lawyer by training he had very little knowledge of the social demographic and cartographic realities of british india this resulted in radcliffe line which gave birth to multiple disputes in the two nations created now what will this paper attempt to this paper will attempt to look not at the two nations which were struggling with the consequence of this unskilled midwifery but at the narrow tract of land that lie at the border of these two countries it will also attempt to trace the web of relationships and ethnic multiplicity at the at these borders with respect to the human displacement born out of the partition of bengal in 1947 and liberation war in 1971 So, while studying Adhir Bishash, the refugee who settled on the West Bengal side of the international border, I am looking at the aftermath of the historical event and focusing on how he found his place in this land of redrawn boundaries. A reading of Deshbhage Sriti, his memoir, allows me to contribute to the understanding of the lives on national borders. positioned on topographical boundaries and strategies of survival adopted by the inhabitants now the bengal border when we are speaking of the bengal border and i'm indeed focusing on the title of my paper and i would look at the border following displacement and migration from east bengal which was forced journeys basically and loss of routes now this border is an area which experienced a large influx of refugees in the aftermath of 1947 and 71 and why do i take these two dates together i do take these two dates because uh, i would like to substantiate my point with joya chatterjee's work the spoils of partition that the influx was a continuous process and as you see the statistics which is given you find in 1951 the census giving a total of this number of refugees and in 1961 there were over 3 million people and in 1973 there were more than 6 million people now this is a cover page of adhir vishwas's memoir titled desh bhagya shriti and this is the cover page of the second uh, the first volume of the book and this is a slipper that is made of tire and which was used by adhir vishwas's father now this slipper acts as a symbol symbol of movement if we can allude to riti ghatok's megha dhaka tara where the slipper steer off and india's eastern front has been marked by continuous movements of people like adhir vishwas within and across the national border the implications of this repeated uh, physical displacements and cultural interactions that require us to look into the simultaneous issues of place and placelessness so travel or movement from one place to another is not therefore compelled by one's desire to see or know but enforced by coercion putting the refugees through repeated process of negotiation humiliation a seeing or knowing of persistent personal loss does they suffered over the grieved uh, say they suffered and grieved over a displaced body 
as a stimulated displacement ripped from their river fed homeland that they regarded as desh and they also adopted survival strategies which the refugees have remained curiously silent about now this uh, survival strategies include the assimilative strategies employed by them which were also regarded as an act of survival these narratives are absolutely not present in the history texts of the high school curricula from the either side of the border so they fail to represent the small voice of history that experienced the great divide during partition of bengal and the ensuing liberation war now if we try to map the emergent culture we would like to look into these narratives of lived experience of the refugees and the survival strategies which to large extent is still unexplored it is evident that this political event cannot be taken merely as an impersonal event Raymond Williams in his essay structure of feeling defined the concept as a component of lived experience of a community an experience that resides primarily in things such as everyday seemingly mundane personal interactions and relationships according to williams experiences are not finished products the lived experiences of the refugees are about their contemporary lives and therefore ones in which they are actively involved which is explicit in their living present so in this paper i would look into the text that is the memoir of adhir bishash published in the year 2005 which questions the emergence of the new land chotti ki notun desh i read the text from the perspective of locating the dynamics of reconstruction done through the acts of remembering forgetting and selectively representing the experiences of past i'd like to mention from the book where he reminisces his native land and also tries to remember his deplorable circumstances when he came to calcutta and started earning as a hawker in the memoir deshbhage sriti bisha speaks about the difference in chill in the weather in india and bangladesh which was then pakistan he had brought some katha for his elder brother for which his father scolded him as the author's father felt that people in calcutta would say bad if he moved around with those rugged raps the brother promptly said tahole ami india e jabo na i would then not go to india so the question arises where do i belong so asking for a refuge in a new land was a matter of the acquisition of space now this space always has an emotional dimension raising this question now this led to the anxieties affecting the identities of the refugees the mention of the contiguous space where the refugees has to stay uh, includes compromise staying with the ones already settled as laborers domestic helps and also with the west bengal natives in this context i refer to ori lofre and his book the production of space where he notes social space is a social product to elaborate it space is indeed produced by the people and is fund- fundamentally social so he argues every society and every mode of production produces a space its own space now this is a write up from adhir bishash's memoir amrato ekhon india which is vol number 2 we would expect bishash before partition to produce space differently than now when he is a refugee reminiscing the same space the reformation of identities as we understand a reassessment of identities is initiated referring to the concept of homi bhava's third space where a mixture leading to the cultural hybridity where refugees get placed in between now this hybrid state of the refugees bring contradictions in knowledge practices and also appropriated to be read anew which this research caters to so in the images that we find we find the detachment from the land and the mother and also the madness involved in the nation building it is as if we are ripping the child from the womb of the mother which gets represented in adhir bishash's picture that he shows adhir bishash and the members of his family seated beside his dead mother he comments how his memories of partition of bengal 1947 is sewed in the wraps of the katha wherein which his mother moves towards her last journey 
exploring this incomplete stories of partition allowed to draw attention to the limits of language or the gaps in between words or indeed in between silences containing the alternative histories shaping fluid identities this memoir serves to give an understanding of how to read the political boundary not only as a record of pain and loss but most imp more importantly as representations of strategies of survival so when we are speaking of desh bhage sriti the lived realities of the refugees like bishas they provide insights eloquent of the marginalities of caste economy and speciality being not from the city they are perplexed as identities neither within nor without so they looked at this urban existence and proverbial mohanagar under an uh, introspective lens so the study is twofold contributing to the prevailing literature on the theories of identity formation by examining identity distress crisis and resolution confronted whereas the effects of the identity issues and the different strategies of acculturation is also studied in this paper these are the cover pages of the four volumes of desh bhagya sriti and i would like to refer that these images are replete with emotions and nostalgia mohana yes you need to wind up yeah i'll wait. i will in 2 minutes employing employing this images in academic constructing allowed me to look at the political event through a different lens stories of living living remained largely unvoiced and many for the matter are now lost to us so with this i move to the displacement and loss and the loss of the land like i refer to wazira fazira ikubli zamindar and his book the long partition and the making of modern south asia that is he, he she speaks of the word displacement instead of migration where migration came to imply both as movement with intention of permanent relocation as well as voluntary exodus and the coming of the refugees was not necessarily to migrate but with the intent of a refuge settling in a new land for the refugees therefore was like living in the shadows of this long partition i move to my conclusion uh, that the refugees lives associated not only with pain and trauma but also their adaptive nature i try to explore how the concept of pain allows the refugees to acculturate and integrate in a new society the study focuses on the emotions of the refugees that carried with them when they arrived at their new home and how this related to the strategies of assimilation integration separation and marginalization i try to capture the identity reformation and the resolution of the refugees like adhir bisha who resettled in the alien country and the identity issues are likely to influence acculturation and psychological well-being of resettling groups this study therefore argues that greater attention needs to be di directed at the intersection of immigrant settlement acculturation and identity development thank you very much thank you mohana uh, thank you for this very touching at the same time very interesting topic Thank you. Uh, I have read one book by Adi Chodi that is Allah Jo Mite Paay. That was yes. a very nice read. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a very interesting topic. And Thank you, sir. And touching at the same time. Okay. Uh, now it's time for Muhammad Nahid Kamal. And Nahid Kamal uh, yes, will speak yes, on sir. identity crisis in Sahidul Zahi's story, Indur Bilai Thala, a critical representation. of the conception of power and negative liberty so over to nakid nakid carry on are you there nakid uh, yes yes sir are you listening okay 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 your order book okay Then thank you start okay i would like to thank uh, shemanti nondi uh, uh she put a different light on virangonath actually uh, the story i am going to uh, present as a paper uh, it's basically on a specific character and she was a virangona 
Uh, that's why I made the point. Okay. Oh, okay. First, uh, let me illustrate uh, the story. Otherwise, uh, it's not possible to you know, elaborate the later thing. So it was a story about Abdul Goni, a Rajagar. A Rajagar means an armed group comprised of Bengali people that helped Pakistan army at that uh, moment of 1971. So that's the point. Uh, a resident of Bhutar Goli. Uh, Bhutar Goli uh, basically a street in uh, typical Dhaka. It was now and at that moment it was present. So uh, Abdul Ghani brought Pakistani army's Lieutenant Sharif along with his soldier to start a crackdown in those areas. I mean uh, in Bhutar Goli uh, and they set fire on some of the houses of that land. They set fires on some of the houses of that land. Khotija was a widow. At its name Khotija was a uh, girl, a not girl, lady actually. And she was a widow and she was in her room to get her radio. Uh, everyone left at that moment, but she was late to get her radio. While all other members of that land abandoned their, abandoned their home to save their life, Lieutenant Sharif saw and raped her. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. she became a Birangona in the sense of, uh, you know, our liberation oil. So Kothija saved her house, but did not able to save her. They came back again and again, and each time they came, they burned down some building. And by the end of November, it was started in, uh, you know, in uh, March. And at the end of November, they burned every house of Bhutal Ghori. I mean, uh, and left Kothija with anguish. It was Abdul Ghani, who was takes advantage of the situation and raped Kothija. Uh, we have to understand this situation uh, carefully because Abdul Ghani was a Bengali and he also, uh, you know, take the advantage. So at the beginning of December, I mean, in 16th December, Bangladesh got liberated from Pakistan. So at the uh, beginning of December, Mukhtibani came back after rescuing most of the areas of Bangladesh. At that time, Khotija burnt their house because their house was intact and looks ugly inside so many burnt houses. That's the point Shoydul Juhil makes. She thought her days of sorrow ends, but Shamsul Alam Khan, a guerrilla fighter, came and uh, some of the people uh, from that street told uh, him that uh, Khotija was raped by that, uh, you know, Lieutenant Sharif and uh, that Abdul Goni, a Rajakar, and uh, she saved his house at ultimately the last moment of November. But Hello. Okay, Shamsul Alim. Uh, hello, are you listening? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Not with any problem. No, no. Are you audible? Yeah. Am I audible, yeah. sir? You're, you're audible. Okay, okay. You thank you. Thank you. You're okay. audible. Shamsul Alim Khan, a guerrilla fighter, again raped her, and. Because she admitted feeding Abdul Goni and some of the Pakistani soldiers. Some other guerrilla fighters saved her and Shamsul Alam Khan. Father made a proposal to make her bride of his son. You know, uh, Shamsul Alam Khan's father, Shamsul Alam Khan did a wrong thing and his father made a proposal to marry uh, with Khotija, but, Khot but Khotija refused. There are three parts of this story, uh, and simultaneously, uh, the story running with three different stories. The second part, I just made it uh, one after another so that it can uh, easily understandable. The second part of the story began in the context of the last two decades of the 20th century. It's in uh, the present condition, in a present condition. Human Kobir, uh, alias Humu, and Jahangir Hussain, alias Jahu, I mean Humu and Jahu, of Bhutar Goli, creates terror and killed a low class civil servant, Officer Alta Bali. Uh, uh, they are the right hand of young leader Ibrahim Khan, who was a son of Shamsul Alam Khan. I mean, uh, you have to understand, Shamsul Alam Khan was a, uh, previously a liberation war fighter, and now his son Ibrahim Khan uh, was become a leader in Bhutar Goli. And some of uh, they made a gang inside of Bhutar Goli, and some of his men killed a civil servant officer. So Khotija later protested against them and they created anarchy in the whole area, I mean uh, that gang. But Shamsul Alam Khan was refrained them to do further havoc. Shamsul Alam Khan actually loved Khotija, that's why uh, he did this. 
Shoujo Joel also wants to tell the reader another short but important story. It's the third story actually. In the story in Durbilai Kala. Purno Lokhi, the daughter of Chandrakanto and Shottu Lokhi, was a common partner in playing games for both boys and girls in Bhutaguli. I mean, in Bhutaguli, there were some Hindu families, and Purno Lokhi was actually uh, a daughter of Chandra Lokhi and Shottu Lokhi, and uh, she most of the time plays with his, you know, uh, with his Muslim uh, friends. At the time of the election, everyone wants vote from her father. Everyone, they are actually uh, in Bangladesh, you know, there are two parties uh, basically uh, most uh, prominent in current time. So one is for, you know, a little bit more secular and other is a little bit uh, more fundamental. So at the time of election, everyone wants vote from our father. We have to understand there's two party. One is a little bit secular and one is a little bit uh, more fundamental. I'm using little bit intentionally actually here. In a very short analysis, Shoyedo Johi illustrates two genre of power politics, the fundamental one and the secular one. Uh, but in his story, he shows that both the political power created a condition that is not suitable for Purno Lokish family. Girls and boys of Bhutar Goli wants her to play with them, but it was a situation that refrained her to do that. In this course of incidents, though she was present, uh, Purno Loki lost her existence from the context, critical and um, uh, boys and girls of Bhutar Goli forgot that once she was a common part of the game. Actually, uh, at the time of election, both team came, uh, you know, to get some vote from Hindu community, but they created a condition so that and Shoyuljur illustrated in his story so that uh, it seems like they are not a part of this society or they are not not a part of that goalie, but they are present there. That's the. Uh, condition uh, both of the team created and show the illustrated it. Uh, Lieutenant Sharif Abdul Goni or later Ibrahim Khan and his gang are like cat. I mean Indur be like Allah. Indur means rat and Viral means uh, cat. You all know that. So it's basically a metaphor that uh, Shoyuddin Johir creates. Uh, Lieutenant Sharif Abdul Goni or later, later Ibrahim Khan and his gang are like cat and Khutiza. Altapali, Purnolokhi and residents of Bhutagoli. I mean, not only Purnolokhi, Altapali or Kutiza, everyone of, uh, re every resident of Bhutagoli are like, you know, rats in his story. By this metaphor, he represents the whole story of operation in different periods in a nutshell. Also, his style made it possible to understand different stories within the story through parallelism. So, now I have to uh, uh, stop. That's the... Uh, story but Paul Require writes in his essay it is the word that has a metaphorical use or of a non-literal meaning or a novel emergent meaning in a specific context I mean we have to understand a specific context in that sense the definition of metaphor by Aristotle as a transposition of an alien name or word is not cancelled by a theory which lays the stress of the contextual action which creates the sh shift of meaning in the word so Indur Bilai Khala, Indur Bilai Khala is a word, basically, uh, is a sentence. Shoyadul Johir changes the context and uh, looks upon the story uh, in 1971 and in, you know, in 1990 or you may call it in 2000. So there are two different time contexts, but same story and it's playing differently. Same game is playing in a different way. That's that's what Shoyadul Johir wants to, uh, you know, uh, some sort of metaphorical and some sort of similarities there between uh, that two condition in 1971 and in 2000. That's what Shoyu Johar wants to illustrate. So, Eckhart in her essay, How to Explain Operation, Priority of Adequacy for Normative Explanatory Theory Rights, Operation Names and Objective Social Phenomena, which is characterized by the harm condition. The group condition and the previous condition. I'm not going to, uh, you know, elaborate the things because we have a little bit uh, shorter of time. Uh, but I'm going to uh, mention. I'm going to mention Ishaya Berlin in this context because he's very important to understand. In his essay, for essay on liberty, 
I normally say to be free to the degree to who is no man or body of man interferes with my activity. Political liberty in this sense is simply the area within which a man can a man can act unobstructed by others. If I am prevented by oh. others from doing what Nothing. I would other sorry. Yes, no, sir. Yes, yes. to wind up. Okay, okay, okay. Sir. A little bit. If I am prevented by others from doing what I could uh, otherwise do, I am to that degree unfree. And if that area is contracted by other men behind beyond a certain minimum, I can be described as being coerced or it may be in, enslaved. I mean, we have to understand the word enslaved. Uh, the people of Hutergul are basically enslaved to some sort of fear. Those guys who liberated us in 1971, later uh, they changed and uh, they took the power and they took the power and they will become the oppressor actually. That's what Shoytudhir wants uh, us to hear and uh, I think he's very good in illustrating that. So he makes up, uh, I just, uh, in, his, in, in my paper, I just wanted to illustrate this negative liberty of Bhutar Goli's people uh, through the story of Shoytudhir. Thank you again. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Narkit Kamal, for your presentation. Now, I uh, open all the four papers for discussion and I uh, invite questions and interactions on these four papers. Uh, I, I, I asked all of you, or those who are interested, to post their questions or comments in the comment box. Uh, since there are no questions, uh, is there anybody who wants to ask a question or wants to or want to interact or uh, raise certain issues on these four papers? No. Now, uh, in, uh, is Ramanusta present? Yes, Pradipta. Uh, Ramanusta, should I? Uh, invite questions because there are no questions here. Yes, if there should I wait or uh, yeah. should I call this session at the end of the session? Yes, uh, if there there are no questions, then we need to move towards the next. Yeah, because we are running short of time. Yeah, yes. So I would like to conclude this session by telling that the papers presented in this session are very, very interesting and touching, and they are quite potent uh, quite potent and powerful to to be uh, developed into uh, research papers full length research papers and i hope that the presenters will write full length research papers out of their presentations i wish them all the best uh, uh, take care have a nice time and this is uh, how we would have to end the session thank you thank you sir thank you very much Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Best of luck. Thank you, Dr. Sham Choudhury. Uh, I mean, thank you, Pradipto, uh, my dear brother. Uh, thank uh, you. Thank you for all the help that you have always been doing with uh, 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 working with me uh, for this journal. Thank you so much. And I also thank the paper presenters. Uh, Shemanti Nondi, De Devashrita, uh, Devashrita Dev, Mohana Chatterjee, and Mohammad Naid Kamal. Now it is uh, uh, time to move. Uh, in fact, we are running late. Uh, uh, now we are going to start the, the business session four, which was originally scheduled at um, six. So uh, uh, business session four will be chaired by Dr. Abhin Chakraborty, Assistant Professor of English at Chandranagar College and he is also uh, another advisor in the editorial board of this journal. Abhin, uh, if you could proceed with this session, please. And Thank and you, Raman. Yes, one, one more announcement is that I just got to know from uh, Alexandra Indira Sanal that she is not uh, being able to, uh, able, to, uh, able to present her paper today so so we will have three paper presenters so that might he help in a way because uh, we are running late so that's the news Bobby, right. please. 
so uh, good evening everyone once again to this uh, session we have therefore three participants in this session parumita ghosh devarun sarkar and uh, anirban banerjee without further delay i would uh, request the participants to uh, uh, proceed with their paper presentations beginning with parumita ghosh whose paper is entitled memory of home a study of shiliguri through, through partition memories Paramita, are you there? Yes. yes, sir. Thank you. Please proceed. So, how many minutes are scheduled for each paper? The last in the last session, uh, all the paper presenters had twelve. So we okay, will so, uh, so. go with that for the time being. But uh, since okay. we have one less participant for this uh, session. maybe we can have a bit more time for discussion if there are questions right so for the time being 12 okay thank you sir um so um hi uh, with gratitude i thank post scriptum journal and dr abin Ch abin chakraborty for this opportunity every family have stories that are remembered through many memories and in the process of telling and retelling stories narrators intentionally and unintentionally narrate the family experiences that shapes identity good evening everyone i am parumita i am sharing a part of my mphil research through literature review and memories gathered of my family and several others who have been staying in siliguri after partition that is rajbansis and the migrated bengali hindus provided me an immense understanding to weave this auto auto ethnographic study of partition and identity far from the usual stories of loss violence pain and struggle partition drew new contours to inflect inflect a uh, diasporic formation and a constant urge to remember home thus becoming part of our everyday lives nostalgia weaves to claim identity Siliguri did not grow in a constant average space but transformed into a town with certain politico economic alterations during colonial period and thereafter partition located in the foothills of terai this marshy small area was a less known small village comprising of just 784 people in 1901 among the inhabitants rajbansis were the largest who owned vast stretches of land however this empty village later became the residence for thousands of evacuees who settled here from the newly formed pakistan partition lines scattered northern bengal between india and pakistan very haphazardly making both rajbansis as well as bengali hindus homeless who settled in this empty land Siliguri being very close to several east east pakistan regions thousands settled here walking just few miles with a hope for better tomorrow that soon this partition problem would end and they would easily return back siliguri thus identifies partition as a prime catalyst in altering this empty village into a city border is a political division between ghor homeland and bahir the diaspora the continuous migration and settlement after partition made every individual settled or staying in siliguri a minority to time as loss and displacement were faced by both rajbansis and the bengali hindus the culture of siliguri did not represent the culture of the migrated population of bengalis nor rajbansis both lost their culture dialect to bengali bhadraloks the so called higher caste being uh, higher caste cultured educated bengali of kolkata that represented the whole of bengal thus engulfed in the circle of time hegemony rajbansis lost their community identity to the migrated bengali hindus and the migrated bengali hindus in turn lost their way of living to the bhadraloks hegemony engulfed in every way every being's way of living in siliguri making a complete running circle interestingly while remembering the subordination the nostalgia of loss after partition was encountered as an important tool to claim and reclaim identity being prey to time hegemony and politics memory of partition shares the nostalgia of loss of identity reiterated through the memory of culture and relived through the oral narrations passed on to generations however this rebuilding and reclaiming underwent a conscious process of re remembering only those memories that are important to reclaim oneself and the community more than the memory of migration and the struggle of partition home left away during partition is remembered every day through the culture dialect and food becoming an essential ingredient to memory 
it is in really interesting to see how cooking is linked to home a home which is unapproachable physically or never visited by many yet home is remembered practiced and passed on to generation through culinary traditions linking back home lost to bahir that is partition time and hegemony the relationship of home homeland and host land that is the migrated land is linked and cultural and the cultural identity of the community that is the district back in east bengal is reinforced likewise rajbansi is also remembered the forgotten food delicacies or cultural or culture while migrating to shiliguri or in the process of ridicule homeland has been reconstructed through memories of parents who once lived opar bangla on the other side of bengal the nostalgia of lost land left behind was just not remembered in through uh, was ju was just not remembered through remembering but what the left behind and repent and repenting for it instead of no instead nostalgia acted as a proud space for remembering home as bodu describes food tastes are socially conditioned and choice of food reflects the social hierarchy a particular spice foreign defined and rem reminded the district desh uh, left behind during partition we looking through these minute lenses a lens of understanding home has been an intersection point of identity and identification of individuals in siliguri and along with it even objects like naming their belongings in memory of their home also hold a unique way to claim identity and the land partition is 7 decades old but the remembrance of homeland is very much a part and process of connecting to one's identity and reconstructing oneself against hegemony the private or the uh, dom domestic sphere keeps intact the food tradition of the community making space to claim reclaim identity and nostalgia tries to reconstitute it a particular way of cooking of a community reconfigures regional rootedness practiced through the through generations creating home away in an unknown land thus the private space tries to remain uncolonized not interrupted by hegemony and women of the household are the gatekeepers of the rituals right while oral traditions pass down the food flavor due to geographical location of siliguri migration has been in a con continuous phase a uh, phase after partition uh, leading to an intermixing of culture traditions food consumption consumptions where both communities rajbansis and bengali hindus communities learn much but lost ma many more northern bengal as a whole shared a common thread in culture in culture tradition aspect language food and therefore when the migrated population settled in shiliguri part of north bengal there wasn't huge cultural differences there was a very accommodating relation between the inhabitants and the migrated settlers for a prolonged time as both communities experienced displacement but later while slowly being victim of the circle of subordination the migrated bengali hindus started being ridiculed by the bhadralooks of kolkata this settled population in siliguri though a minority as they have settled in a new land yet started claiming to be superior to the landed rajbansis the dominance of the by the landless individuals uh, towards the landed inhabitants and ridiculing them treating them as inferior and linking to the pride of being much much more educated rich smart uh, as they claim to belong from a progressive much arable land but because of partition they had to settle in this un uninhabitable malaria prone ramp area they also claim that it was them who made this space a ha this uh, space siliguri a habitable space a space uh, therefore space land acts as an important tool to demarcate the hierarchy and estimate superiority for the settled thus in this pure rajbansis were ridiculed made fun ridiculed for the culinary skills as in turn migrated hindus were mocked by bhadralooks for their dialect or adding too much spice in food however in this circle of ridicule remembrance acts as a strong tool for identity reclaim the kind of food consumed has definitely altered with time with the influence of new trapped in hegemony but both rajbansi and migrated bengali hindus though evolved yet survived the passage of time hegemony while claiming and reclaiming themselves food consumption enables to remember a various situation and shapes identities making it a very important tool of representation the cuisines cooked uh, the reflected the pain of leaving back many things as well as the pleasure to remember those happy days homeland has been reconstructed through memories of the parents who once lived opar bangla then that means the other side home is remembered every day and lived through culinary skills the flavor of food in this migrated land shiliguri this memory of food the process of cooking is usually passed on to generation where women as explained earlier are gate gatekeepers trying to bring the flavor of home in the household kitchen or in their in-laws after marriage 
the private space or the domestic sphere keeps intact the tradition of food of community as a space to claim but also reclaim the identity the nostalgia of taste food cooked by the mother back in the land and trying to reconstitute it culinary taste does not reflect just class but regional differences in food food consumption represent the regional understanding of how different region have has different food culture and it also sets a different hierarchy linking this i'll be sharing an interesting story of my family who had migrated to shiliguri in the year 1950 from pachakola uh, pabna district now bangladesh after partition late uh, jitendranath ghosh my grandfather a police sergeant was given the choice from the government to either stay in pabna or settle in newly formed india he chose the latter and he came to west bengal uh, he finally decided to settle in shiliguri with his family where land prices were much affordable as time passed my uncles got married and they were married to family settled in shiliguri from various parts of east pakistan uh, my aunties were aware of their parents migrating to shiliguri after partition but partition as a subject never clinked their minds as they sternly denied being part and parcel of partition as they were born in shiliguri and moreover for them partition meant a story of pain sorrows and violence however unknowingly knowingly their every day is weaved with memories of home left behind in east pakistan sharing a conversation of one evening elder aunt adds pabna district e lokera ei bhabei torkari banay banay na that means pabna district do not make curry this way younger aunt added to it ha ha kintu amra dhakai ra ei bhabei kori shashuri oi bhabe ko banato that means yes but we people from dhaka dhaka cook this way mother in law used to cook that way the conversation intensified when elder aunt smiles uh, smiles and shares shoshure to dhakai er ranna khub bhalo lagto oi macher jhol shobji diye ar echore torkari dhakai er der ranna khub roshik hoy pabna der theke that means father in law like dhaka district food more the fish curry had lot of vegetables in it the unripe food, vegetable curry wow it was awesome and uh, and uh, dhaka district food is much more spicy than uh, pabna mother adds to this Ma, though born in and brought up in shaib ganj bihar uh, her her mother was from pabna district and so so she claims to belong there she uh, she says ha uh, pabna lokera to shudhui kalo jira lanka diye patla jhol jhol khay pabna ra khub halka ranna kore this means that pabna district uh, make fish curry with just adding black cumin seeds and chili as spice and prefer less oily spicy food the conversation moved further and my aunt proclaimed how dhakaiya were better cooks excelling in uh, culinary skills to pabna they then shared that, that this difference in taste of food was only experienced after marriage the way of cooking the flavor automatically made them feel the difference in cooking from their maternal home the change in food processing has always been the reason for understanding the regional differences existing in culinary processes however the how the food has been prepared back in east bengal uh do none of them was born there but still they claim that the culinary process uh, about this culinary process to the homeland district their parents belong to there has been a culture of food passed on to generation through memories where home plays a pseudo character being somewhere across the border and the imagination of homeland is passed down to generation every interview recorded has shared the nostalgia of the land more with food gokul pitha sweet dish tile naru sweet made of sesam seeds and the kind of food consumed lost in time shiliguri has memories holding various strategies to claim reclaim and produce an identity by picking several lens of history loss is not about lost but remembering lost streams way to claim identity among the various communities settling settling in here in shiliguri yadav committee also settled uh, here uh, mostly from pabna rajshahi dhaka district after partition this community held strong uh, association all over india after partition and thus uh, uh, adding to one other interview uh, of chandra ghosh says that his father was actively involved with yadav samiti in shiliguri as it was the only link to connect to those relatives settled in shiliguri lost by partition this link this search of home through several ways identifies the relentless effort to made to link past the border is unviolable for the community both in political and emotional ways never can return back home basha but through these links relive memory visit back the land left behind kept safe 
kept safe in the imagination, reframed and glorified as golden days and taking pride in it. Remembering home, land, community, identity was and is mandatory. There have been several sammilanis formed either, either district-wise or community-wise to meet, discuss or perform annual functions to link home, their self in this land. The process of remembrance has also been has also been through naming homes around the city of Siliguri. There have been several sh shops, stores, houses in the name of the districts where once once home delved delved, like Kumilda departmental store or salon named Pabna, linking their home land as their part of their everyday. Thus, the story of sameness shared between migrants and inhabitants revolved around, uh, around the circle of emotion, culture, nostalgia, weaving stories through their everyday lives. Changing the lives of individuals is recorded and an archive is made within the dominant histographies through memories. Time, space, place, identity. Arunta, while, uh, yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, uh, please wind up now. Yes, sir. I just need one minute. Time, space, place, identity, while replaced or displaced, rekindles the importance and thus struggle to get back uh, get back begins by claiming and then reclaiming them. Deriving from Ipshita Haldar, partition in Shiliguri and migration is a conceptual space where borders do not outline the out, uh, meaning of divide as it is an ongoing process. The uh, political divide uh, bifurcating lands is strange and irrational here as it cuts along house, village, families, neighborhood and shared linguistic and cultural space. This happens at the divide lends forth to a continuous crossing of borders in imagination for all and meeting the near and dear ones through the emotional border crossing and the memories relieved through oral narratives and passed on to generation, making it an everyday being to form identity. Thank you. Thank you, Paramita, for your presentation. We now move on to the second paper of the panel, the Barun Shorkar's paper, A City to Look at and Presenting the World to the City, reading Bishto Bangla Gate and Eco Park in Newtown, West Bengal. Yeah. De Barun? Yeah. Okay. Am, I, am I audible? Please proceed. Yes, you are audible. Please proceed. Okay. And Paramita, please um, uh, mute your speaker. Okay. Uh, so the planned city east of Salt Lake City, east of Calcutta, Kolkata, which is now grown by the goes by the generic signifier of Newtown, has accrued a growing body of literature over the past decade. These works have approached Newtown from a range of perspectives, from concerns of land acquisition, placemaking, the information technology sector, market relationships, to the concerns of uh, primitive accumulation. But there has remained. Devaru, can Akuna. you be a bit louder? Okay. Uh, can you speak a bit, a bit more loudly? Is it better now? Yeah, it is better now. And Paramita, please okay. mute your speaker. Okay. Uh, but there has been a glaring lacuna in the existing literature, which has, which has not engaged with the state-sanctioned built environment that has come up in Newtown. Uh, this is eastward shift of the urban agglomeration around Calcutta, a case of bypass Devarun. urbanism. Uh, yeah. Devarun, sorry to interrupt once again. Uh, please uh, slow your pace a little. Right. Uh, speak a bit okay. slowly so that uh, others are able to pick up what is being discussed. Right. Okay. Okay. Just sorry, sir. Yes. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this eastward shift of the urban agglomeration in of Calcutta, uh, which has been termed a case of by bypass urbanism has been studied and approached from a variety of theoretical and empirical concerns, but precise readings of architectural and landscape configurations have not been pursued in a sustained and engaged manner. This has resulted in articulations which paint the town as ghastly and dystopic, particularly uh, in the book Beyond, Beyond Kolkata by Ante, uh, Samadhar and Sten, uh, without engaging with the intent of state-led planning and design spaces. So for, uh, for them, uh, because the city is empty, it becomes a this this dystopic uh, uh, sort of a sort of a landscape, but what is the intent of the of of, of the state state lit planning is, is uh, and and sort of the construction of utopias that goes on behind it is not investigated. To investigate the state intent of state lit planning beyond the tropes of land use, land acquisition, development of service sector or real estate sector, the paper uh, the paper engages in material semiotics 
an embodied approach to reach to design the interruptions in the landscape, particularly the Vistuang Langit and Eco Park. Uh, for heuristic reasons, I do not go into other landscape uh, sort of punctuations because though there are many other landscape uh, sort of architectural interventions which one could study in, in the city itself. Um, it is important here to note, following Ong's work, that such precise architectural punctuations in urban landscape by state, state mo by the state mobilize a range of discursive uh, materialities, uh, uh, affects which which uh, announce the arrival of Asian cities on the global stage. Ong notes the dynamic approach to spectacular cities show that take, takes in urban spectacles go beyond mere capital accumulation to include the generation of promissory values about geopolitical significance of the city and the country it stands for in metonomic relationship. Here, it also stands in metonomic relationship to the uh, to the state of West Bengal, for instance. Um, okay. Uh, so I just go into the short history of Newton, just, so just to give a little context. Newton was supposed to be named after the longest serving chief minister uh, of CPM uh, Jyoti, as Jyoti Basunagar, akin to, akin to Bidan Nagar, essentially. Um, Newton has a distinct morphology compared to the older planned city of Salt Lake. The city is divided into four action areas, three of them being under the development at the moment. City houses various IT and business parks dotting the city with a large density, in, 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 especially in, in the central business district displays a certain characteristic of what is called compact cities with multiple intensive land use, which results in a mix of residential, commercial, and industrial complexes at close distance. Uh, this is a far cry from the secluded industrial land use planning that was planned for Salt Lake City, where industrial units were placed at a distance outside the residential areas, which later developed into Sector 5, which is now maintained by NDITF. It is also distinct from the city of Calcutta, which has had a high density of commercial and industrial complexes in the center of the city, with residential quarters spread to the north and the south. Newton contra Salt Lake is a more polycentric topography, has a more polycentric topography with major arterial road, which houses key cultural centers cur curving in and out of the town to provide it with a distinct urban structure. Um, so at the center of the uh, uh, sort of the City, there we, we have what is called the Narkelbagan um, uh, Narkelbagan Nar intersection, and then the Narkelbagan intersection is where. Uh, Devarun, you need to improve. Devarun, yeah, you are audible, but not much. And uh, the point is that you are speaking so fast that some of the words are being lost. So uh, I'm just. Using a mic. Uh, I am using a mic. Yeah, I know you're using the mic. What I'm saying is that either increase the volume or uh, speak a bit slowly. That is, reduce your tempo. Okay, okay, okay. There's nothing I can do about the sound. So I'll just slowly. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the then center, just uh, speak at a reduced yeah. pace. Yeah, yeah. The, at the center of uh, Newton uh, at Nakil uh, you you find what is stood, but it goes by the name of Vishwa Bangladesh. The gate is essentially a, a viewing deck. It it, 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 it it functions as an architectural site which one looks at when one passes through the road, one moves around in the on the roads nearby, but also it, it acts as a place, a site from which the city city itself is then visualized and it is the it's a site from which the city must be looked at. This how how the how this particular curation of the of, of, of the view of Newton happens is very interesting because one when one enters it enters the gate, one is instantly greeted by a poem in, poem by uh, the current chief minister uh, Amta Banerjee, and this it, the the quality of the poem is, is beyond concern, and it doesn't matter what it essentially this poem is announcing is 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 an universal sort of brotherhood of mankind fraternity of some sort, and all all over the gate it it displays. Various figures of Bengal Renaissance and various aphorisms. Now, while doing it, it on the one side it does these things which are much more concrete. Uh, on the other hand, there, there, there's a there's a city in movement. The, there is a there's a city which is growing. The buildings, the landscape is in movement, and at the same time, the vehicles are moving underneath the underneath uh, the gate and the, the place where the person is the viewer is standing. So, uh, what happens is that. Uh, the mobility of the city, the very flow and movement of the city, is spectacularized. It is, it is made 
it is asterisized and it is separated from its sort of uh, it is represented in a way by giving by giving a particular angle and a side from which to look at it now one if one moves a little not towards vishwanath again one finds that in eco park there are these uh, there is a small section which houses the miniature wonders of the world this section um, it itself uh, the plan for it was created by the uh sorry to intervene uh robin uh, if i may uh, yes uh, they were on uh, uh, there might be some technical problem yes, at his side or yes. may maybe he is not at the right uh, position now to uh, present this paper if i hear because because there are so many pauses Uh, like uh, and and when they were only speaking, we cannot understand anything. There is no, uh, it's no use listening to this paper. I I don't understand why why this is happening. There's nothing I can do about it. Please, what I mean can is. Can you rejoin? Can you rejoin? Oh, okay. Can okay. you uh, leave the meeting and rejoin and see if that makes things better? Hello. 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 Yes, we can yes, hear you. They were on. We can hear you. So, uh, to the north, northern. I just, I just, I, I, I can't. If you missed out the previous bit, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so, the uh, the plan for eco park is prepared by uh, Bengal Urban Infrastructure Development Limited and and uh, and some private uh, company, which is commissioned by the WB Hitco, uh, which is a private land holding body, sort of acts as a land holding body of New Town. In the northern part of Eco Park is a small enclave which requires an entry fee of thirty rupees, which houses miniature versions of wonders of the world. It houses miniature versions of Taj Mahal, pyramids, Sphinx, Christ the Redeemer, and etc. On the side of Eco Park, the design intent of the one, one of the wonders of the world is articulated in the language of time-space compression. The internet can make the world so close, it argues. Hence, Eco Park and Hitco authorities also ready to make the people the traveler of the world to. A traveler of the world to the eco park, so a seven wonders of the world is on near near the home at Newtown. The section of the park is relatively small compared to the overall size of the park, because of which this part of the park is relatively dense. Unlike Bishu Bangla Gate, which is the site where the urban landscape of Newtown is its speed and development is spectacularized, the presentation and erection of miniature versions of the wonders of the world links the urban to the global, the local. Um, the local and the global in a condensed manner. The fact that the representation of the monuments and ancient wonders are kitschy is beside the point, because that the these architectural punctuations play in the urban. What the role that they play is beyond the concern of representational adequacy. On the on the other hand, the Bishwamangala Gate presents the urban urban skyline and the mobility of the road from a particular perspective for a price. The enclave of seven wonders presents metonymic relationship to the city. Assembling and assembling a representation of certain architectures and monuments. The, the above interventions in the landscape of the urban create the landscape with a particular visual economy for consumption. The visual infrastructures function as sites where the urban is exercised in a in a particular manner. Infrastructure has emerged as a driving force of contemporary imaginations and discourses to create deep. Fields of desire and imagination. This is why infrastructure must be seen not as a field of politics but also aesthetics. 
of poetics that signify doesn't necessarily refer to some direct signified assemblages which are ordered spatial temporally in certain way the two visual infrastructures above assemble a range of aspects discourses and bodies linking the times and space in a particular configuration is criticizing the urban and contemporary west bengal in a very peculiar manner the cities of calcutta and salt lake city have which had their own share of global histories and linkages from the pre colonial mercantile era to post colonial and post colonial era new town remains steadfast in mobilizing a global urban linkage explicitly by visualizing it and crafting a commodity out of visual experience the visual bangla gate walls mobilize the nationalist and modern bengal history while at the same time announcing the universal fraternity of mankind while the walls act as a celebration and celebration of mankind for deployment of a particular arrangement of bengali personalities the viewing deck opens up the city's landscape displaying the skyline of the city buildings and elevated metro now please wind up now I'm just finishing. Just one more minute. Similarly, the deck provides a particular viewing angle above the intersection, which allows for a view of the mobility of bodies. The gate, on the other hand, is a marker in the landscape for moving bodies and vehicles on the road. Okay. Far away from the original scene of Newton, the process of primitive accumulation, which marks the inauguratory moves of the city, the above architecture mobilizes a range of affective material and discursive linkages to ground the city of Newtown within a register which marks the entry of West Bengal's urbanism into 21st century city at a time when cities are being renamed in India to mark a revivalism of lost history Newtown bears its generic english name while enacting a particular form of bengali identity which has assembled the city to look at while presenting the world to the city in the city by enacting such an assembly Newtown locates Self firmly within a global history of urbanism, where the city and the world are intimately linked, and only a step away. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for the mess up. Can we proceed to the next paper presenter immediately? Uh, yes, sir. I am Anirban Banerjee. I, I think I am. Yes, uh, yes, yes, Anirban. uh please proceed with your paper okay can i turn on the video if, if i may are you going to uh, offer a presentation yeah i'm going to uh, share a screen also i have a powerpoint yes please yes please okay thank you uh hello everyone good evening uh before i start my paper uh, i would like to share the screen with you all so that it it becomes a little bit more relatable to what i am going to say just a second Anyone, we can't see the screen. Oh, okay, I'm uh, trying to actually. Uh... Yes, it's visible now. Okay, thank you. Can you move from the power? Yeah, right, right. Okay, thank yeah. you. Uh, hello, I'm Anirban Banerjee, an MPhil scholar from Kazi Nazir University. My paper is about uh, the temple village of Maluti, which is um, I am going to reappraise the Bengali identity and culture from the margin. While defining the Bengali identity and culture, most of the people often simplifies it, and in their replies, we find some recurrent terms like Mach Bhat, Robi Thakur, Durga Pujo, and Roshabol, but. is the bengali identity only limited to these terms well those above mentioned terms do represent some facets of bengali culture but limiting the entire culture within those terms simplifying the identity is basically diminishing its complex nature by making its other facets obsolete for understanding the culture we can take example of the little hamlet moluti which is literally at the margin 
or border of Bengal and Jharkhand. For many years, this village has suffered from lack of government attention and after independence. While uh, the nearby villages and towns were enjoying the products of electricity, this village was shunned to primitive darkness. It is only in the first decade of 21st century that they have seen the flash of electricity. But in the earlier days, the village has seen much prosperous times. With the help of Mr. Gopaldas Mukherjee, an ex-military personnel, uh, a local teacher, and an independent researcher who has reached his 90s, we have come across the fact that with the break of 16th century, the then densely forested stony land has observed, uh, observed the emergence of a new kingdom, the non court kingdom or tax-free kingdom. As a reward for rescuing the pet hawk of Sultan Alauddin Hussein Shah of Gaur, a 12-year-old orphan Brahmin boy, Boshantarai, received this tax-free land consisting of, uh, consisting of villages like Damra, which was the first capital, Moluti, the final capital, Masra, Kashtogoda, Hostigada, Katigram, Surichoa, etc. Now, uh, when we pay attention to the center only, the identity of the Bengali people may be reduced to Majbhat, Robi Thakur, Durga Pujo, and Roshogolla, and those who are in power successfully cash on these simplified versions. The plurality in Bengali culture, the complexities it has acquired over the ages are often denied. Moluti, known as Guptokashi, in the times of the Sunga rulers in Bengal, is absent in the cultural map of the Bengalis. But like the ghost of Hamlet's father, this absence haunts. In this paper, we wish to capture the Deridian ontology with reference to Moluti, a place associated with the hallowed presence of Shadhok Bamakhaba. As Derida says, even after the political end of communism, with the fall of Soviet Russia, Marx shall haunt the European minds as the ghost of Hamlet's father haunted the play. According to Derrida, neither one can prove the existence of a ghost nor deny it. Thus, this idea of ontology challenges the idea of pre-existing homonymous term ontology of existence. Similarly, when we consider the present as the center of one culture, by default, we marginalize the, its past existence. It is only then that Majbhat, Dorobithakur, Durga Pujo becomes the identity of Bengali culture, and the past as presented by the Hamlet Moluti, remains in the margin as the unacknowledged legislature, legislature of Bengali culture. But as the margin always try to subvert the position of center, the ghost of the past makes its presence palpable so that the present is often shocked. Moluti was once a flourished Bengali establishment, but with rolling times, it lost its glory and became the ghost of its past existence. When one comes face to face with the past and watches the densely situated terracotta temples of Moluti, the absence of its past existence haunts us. But one cannot deny its presence. The village is not even in the political territory of Bengal, and still, even in its fragile condition, shocks us as the apparition of Banco, even enough to topple our present like Macbeth. Thus, it is necessary to take heed of the past and acknowledge the complex cultural identity of Bengal as represented by Moluti, which is beautiful with its plurality. With the help of Mr. Gopaldas Mukherjee, the lone flag bearer of Moluti, we have come across the rich cultural heritage of the village. Due to his 20 years long research over Moluti's cultural heritage, the village has recently come into government focus and restorations are taking place. Uh, but till then, an irreparable onslaught of time has taken its course over the cultural heritages of Moluti. Remains of total 108 terracotta temples can be found in the little village of only 406 hectares or 4.06 square kilometer, which is much greater in density than that of Vishnupur Bakura, which is of 392 square kilometers. But now only 72 to 75 uh, temples are in existence. The village was once under the rule of Mollo kings of Bakura. And thus, one finds a curious similarity among the temples of the two places. 
However, it is quite a curious thing to know that even though enjoying a tax-free land, the rulers of Nankormoluji never indulged into making a palace of their own and lived in mud houses like the other inhabitants of the village. What they did, what they did throughout the, the reign was digging numerous water bodies as the land was stony in nature and suffered from water crisis, established a prosperous village by situating people from various places and gave them lands to cultivate, which contributed to the cultural enrichment of the place, and most importantly, built temples. But the question may arise that why so many temples in such close proximity? With the help of Mr. Gopal Das Mukherjee, we come across a funny answer that the temples were made initially due to the order uh, from due to the order from the Queen King's Kuliguru, but in later times it became a matter of competition among the four brothers of the royal family, and as a result, we find such a rich heritage. Another important heritage of the village is the village goddess and the Kuladevi of the king Mamolika literally meaning face only goddess. The interesting fact about the goddess is that it was there even before human establishment in that region. It was a seat of Amitabhasana Vajrajana Buddhists and their deity Pragya Pandaravasini. Until now, the idol of goddess Pandora is there in the temple. It is said that the goddess was found by the Kulaguru Dandiswami of Sumeru Mat of Benaras in ruins and he worshipped the idol as Mamolika. A notable fact is that the Sumeru Mot is responsible for transforming numerous Buddhist shrines into Hindu temples. Thus, this apparently innocent fact can be part of a bigger propaganda. We find another curious fact among the terracotta temples of Moluti. Among the terracotta temples of Moluti, when we see a Kali temple is made in the model of Vaishnava Ras Manjo which can be seen as a beautiful mixture of two cultures. We can also find a Muslim shrine of Pir Kala Sahib, the land for which was contributed by Princess Kashishwari Devi of Moluti. In this shrine, we can find a very unique aspect of cultural mixture when we see the use of Sridur or vermilion, which cannot be found anywhere else. Thus, we see that the entire village is an example of cultural integrity and plurality, which goes same with Bengali culture. Throughout the ages, this stony land has observed numerous cultural changes. Beginning with Vajrayana Buddhism, this land con contained cultures with the philosophical views of Shaktism, Shaivism, Vaishnavism, and then Muslim and tribal cultures. Temples made in the form of masjid, church, and temple together uh, in the same compound, Kali temple in the form of Ras Mancho, Vermilion used to worship a Muslim peer are exemplary of such a diverse culture, cultural cohabitation. Santas, who have been a part of par part and parcel of this entire village, also finds this Kali Puja of this village as a festival of their own. It has been same for centuries that Santas celebrating the Kali Puja for seven days long in their own way and doing Kali Puja. The absence of this large chunk of cultural identity becomes very much palpable when we come face to face with this ghost from the past. But what caused such a flourishing establishment to turn into a deserted village? When we visit the, this village, we can only find elderly people clinging to their hereditary homes, whereas the young are scattered throughout the world. Therefore, none of them are really concerned about their own homeland. From an interview with Mr. Gopal Das Mukherjee, I came to know that the main reason for such a condition is incapability to cope up with the rapidly changing world. People who used to live by their hereditary occupations in the village gradually found their occupations futile and started moving to nearby towns. Lack of government attention made them abandon their homelands and gradually forget about their curious past. According to Mr. Mukherjee, the only purpose for this research, for his research, was to bring back the inhabitants of this village. And according to him, the only way to reviving, uh, only way of reviving the village is boosting the tourism for the village. And to boost the tourism, we need to take heed of the ghost 
and fill up the absence or gap in our cultural identity caused by excessive attention to the center and our effort of finding a singular definition to our cultural identity. Thank you. Thank you, Anirvan, for your uh, presentation. Yeah. There were a couple of questions uh, uh, for Paramita Ghosh, but the discussion actually uh, took place within the chat box itself. So uh, I don't want to uh, repeat uh, those uh, questions and answers, but if there are other questions, uh, we can obviously discuss them uh, for a brief while. So uh, I would request the other participants, if they have any questions, to please share those questions. If uh, questions aren't there, then let me ask. Uh, OK, yes, Shama Prasad Chakladar has a question. Yes, please. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, that, um, how this, uh, uh, can you can you please uh, rejoin? Hello. Yes. Your voice is breaking. Am I audible now? Yeah. 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 Am I am I audible now? Yes. Yes. yes go ahead. Uh, my question is that uh, that we are uh, we are in one hand we are getting an. Uh, a strong identity with this uh, with the Hindu the Brahmanic culture of Tarapit. Okay. okay. Uh, in another way, on Buddhist culture is also existing in Maruti area. Okay. Then, yes. but we are also having a strong link between that Brahmanic culture with this uh, Buddhism, uh, Buddhist culture of uh, uh, that is Anirvan is uh, trying to point out, uh, delving uh, out uh, from the history or uh, little bit uh, going back to at least. Uh, uh, 500 years, uh, 500 years back. So how he is connecting yeah. with that? Uh, well, actually, uh, the Vajrayana Buddhism was highly influenced by Hinduism. Uh, actually, the tantra, the tantra they were practiced and they used to practice during the, their times uh, was highly influenced by the Shaivism and uh, the tantra of Hinduism. So I think they are quite linked as uh, we find uh, very uh, many shared goddess and goddesses and gods among those two uh, philosophical views, like the Vajradhar, uh, in which we which we can find in Hinduism also, and even in the goddess Tara, who is um, a famous goddess from Buddhism and also a famous goddess of uh, our, uh, Hinduism, as we can find in Tara uh, I think it answers your question. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kara. Um, Obin, may I add something? I had what is the Yeah. Um, it was very interesting a paper, and regarding the amalgamation of uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, it was a kind of uh, general uh, happening in in the in the 12th and 13th century. Uh, Buddhism and Hinduism they came very close and uh, Tara Buddhist goddess goddess Tara is not that Tara pit. Tara is very much akin to our concept of Shodashruti. Okay. If you knowledge of goddess, uh, uh, goddess of knowledge, uh, and 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 uh, the Akhoba Buddhism, I think uh, it comes uh, the yes, Tara. yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. and um, that tantra is it's very close. It's very close to Hindu tantra, and Hindu tantra is uh, closely uh, the the practice that we are um, practicing now. The, all those rituals, they are very much influenced by Buddhist culture, and uh, in 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 some cases, uh, while we are not very certain about the uh, about the idol, uh, sometime Buddhist idol or Jain Jain idols, Jain idols of uh, uh, Parashunath, perhaps they call it. Uh, they have been uh, worshipped as very close to uh, Narayan in Hindu 
some 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 figures are worshipped as narayan and some some are worshipped as shiva if you look at buddhist spots and hindu spots you will find that some of the buddhist idols are worshipped in a hindu way that has been uh, that that may be uh, regarded as a kind of amalgamation of identity that was my observation thank you sir for this valuable opinion it was really nice thank you thank you jyotida any other questions observations okay uh, since there are no other questions i just have a couple of observations so far as onivan's uh, paper is concerned uh, Onivan, have you looked at the discourses regarding the construction of heritage? I mean, you are talking about why Maluti has been neglected, how it is now being uh, revived as a kind of a tourist spot, uh, focusing on the concept of heritage. But have you looked at discourses of heritage construction? Um, not till now. Actually, I am in for, um, for the process of forming the entire paper, so I, I will look up. Looking at that, right. So that is something that I would request you to look at because that would give yes, you sir. certain interesting avenues for further research. Also, uh, the issue about hauntology. I mean, uh, the idea of Bengal as a land of plurality, a land where multiple religious and cultural uh, streams have. mingled and fused with each other is something that is not actually uh, neglected that particular idea is something which is celebrated in fact uh, whether it is durga pujo or our celebration of christmas or eid or uh, goddesses like bon bibi and so on and so forth that aspect of the plurality of bengali identity is something that we regularly celebrate so the hauntological aspect i don't think is particularly applicable with respect to the issue of cultural diversity so far as maluti as a space is concerned i'm sure you're right that it has been neglected for uh, several decades now but again neglect and uh, resurgence is resurgence of interest isn't necessarily the equivalence of a hauntological return as proposed by derida so i think there is scope for refining your arguments regarding that particular theoretical angle of the paper okay um so i will look into that uh, i think i i might have missed it uh Okay, I, I look into that. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, another uh, question uh, that I had was about the paper of Paramita. Uh, Paramita, did you look into the partition archives? There are several partition archives with a, which are digitally available now. Did you look into those archives? Um, I, uh, yes, means for um. archives for uh, what i didn't understand so if you could just elaborate what you wanted to say yeah what i was asking you about uh, was that whether you had looked into the partition archives uh, regarding the various oral memories which have been documented by different researchers which are available online regarding uh, further corroboration of the arguments that you had presented um sir uh, uh, yes sir uh, sir the thing is that uh, in respect to uh, siliguri i have the uh, means of of course the archiving uh, means the archived uh, um, oral narratives has been the base and through the them i have streamed to understand siliguri and uh, how siliguri has formed but uh, in respect to uh, siliguri there has been very uh, limited understanding of how and what oral narratives has been talking and thinking about means till my until my knowledge means i did not get into so uh, vast understanding of any oral narratives or archived materials related to 
uh, the understanding of home or uh, the culture resistance existing out here or the identity claiming uh, uh, I, I think so that uh, maybe my uh, restrictions or I, I literally did not get into those archives but I, okay. obviously uh, uh, I would suggest so, that you look at some of these uh, archives that are uh, being prepared some by Jadupur University some by Stanford University and I think they will provide you with some additional resources as well no, sir, sir uh, those um, the obviously I have referred to uh, Jadupur's uh, uh, archive materials, oral narratives, because that have been my that had been my base to understand. Else, uh, understanding oral narratives and understanding uh, East Partition, because right. part East Partition, Bengal Partition uh, stories have actually been a silent story. Uh, sir um, Shomita Shen. Uh, then um, my uh, I I can't remember uh, my, every of the writers understanding and uh, about uh, narratives and archives has been the base of my understanding and streaming to this uh, research. Okay, uh, another observation that I have is that since uh, you are focusing on the relationship between food and identity and memory and culture it would also be uh, useful to look at certain uh, theoretical insights and uh, formulations emerging out of food studies. I mean, uh, there is a book called Food and Culture, which is now into its uh, sixth or seventh edition. There are uh, special issues on food and culture and society. There is a book by, uh, Mr., uh, by Professor Brown on understanding food principles and preparation so i think that is also something that would help you uh, in uh, formulating further new avenues for your research definitely definitely sir thank you so much okay thank you uh, for to both uh, anirban and paramita i wish i had the opportunity to uh, offer some observations regarding devarun's paper as well but unfortunately, like others, I also was not able to make much head or tail of it because of problems of audio. And um, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, in future, the other participants will uh, not be suffering from some uh, such uh, technical problems. Right. So uh, thank you to all the participants. We will now bring this uh, session to a close. Thank you, sir. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Congratulations to all participants. Thank you, sir. So I'll uh, hand the session over to Ramanujda once again. Thank you, Dr. Chakravarti. Thank you, Abhin, as I always call you. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks to all the participants. Uh, yes, Devarun's paper. Uh, I also could not understand anything. I'll request everyone to uh, please start with an introduction about yourself and uh, please turn your mic on, uh, uh, I mean, turn your camera on as well, if uh, there are no big constraints. And uh, uh, as for Obin, uh, uh, I really thank him once again. And I'd like to uh, tell you all that uh, when we started this day, we were talking about open access. And Obin is uh, editing another open access journal. I am sharing it here uh, with you all now. Uh, this is Postcolonial Interventions and Interdisciplinary Journal of Postcolonial Studies. So this is the journal that the Dr. Chakraborty edits. Uh, so uh, uh, we all are, uh, and those uh, uh, who are the members in our editorial advisory board, we all are working for uh, making things open access. So that is something about Obin and me. We both are uh, editing open access journals. So uh, now uh, we will quickly move on to the last session of uh, this second day of this we webinar, the business session five. Now, now the first thing about this business session five is that the chair, Dr. Anindita Chatterjee, could not be here and uh, uh, to my rescue uh, i have already requested dr jyoti shankar mondal jyotida to chair this session and as always he is there to my rescue so uh, 
So the, this session will be chaired by Dr. Jyoti Shankar Mondal, Assistant Professor of English at Shidhu Kano Beach uh, University. And the paper presenters are Shomi Nandi, Onnesha Chattopadhyay, Shorob Kumar Sharkar, and Akash Sinha. So this is, the, the, his session is a full house. Uh, we hope to uh, end uh, this session um, by uh, 8 20 8 30 max probably so uh, dr mondal over to you thank you ramanuj welcome to the business section five and as ramanuj has already pointed out we have four paper presenters therefore may, may i request uh show show me nondi uh, to read out his paper, uh, her paper and the title of her paper is adda Bengali's Institution of Expression and Argument. Uh, show me, please switch on your audio as well as video and add a brief introduction of yourself. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Sir, I am unable to on my camera because it's a problem in my laptop. So, uh, Good evening, everybody. I am Shomi Nondi. I am a postgraduate student of Presidency University. The name of my paper is Adda, Bengali's Institution of Expression and Argument. We all are familiar with a popular song of Manna De, Coffee House She Adda Ta Ajar Nei. I hope my topic reminds that popular song with beautiful lyrics. That song has presented a brief narration about some people, their activity, and a nostalgia about their meeting and adda. But the Bengali word adda has no exact English connotation. It generally means gossiping or chatting, but it may also be considered as, a, as an informal mode of discussion and debate within a generally homogeneous group. Adda is a form of discussion. It has a very artistic way of seeing life and seeing many events of life. Adda is an uh, unseparated part of Bengali's life and culture. Adda is, a, Adda is like a basic behavior of this community. Wherever they, they are, Bengalis are, whether it is in New York or London or Calcutta, Adda always stays, remain as a part of their natural habit, as a part of Bengali's popular culture. This art of discussion is full of debate, argument, discussing something like music, books, politics, food, cinema, different social issues, etc. Adda sometimes has social, uh, great social values. Adda not only brings together people of same or occasionally dissimilar age groups to talk on any issue that has direct or indirect relation to life, to the people engaged in the, that Adda. One of the most important aspect of Adda is that it creates a kind of social bonding am among man and woman of dissimilar taste, education, profession, and so on, and allows the free expression and interchange of ideas in an informal mode. If we go through the evolution of Adda, then Mojlishi Adda, we can say it of informal chat sessions with mouth watering food and cha is a quintessential part of Bengali's experience and is wonderfully captured in novels and stories from West Bengal. We all know about Tenida, Ghonada, this kind of books, and they have portrayed Adda very beautifully. And sometimes uh, those kind of discussions have some productivity. We know the Adda of Feluda. Ghonada and Tenida, these beloved characters created by writers Premento Mitro, Naran Gangopadhyay, have thrown a light on Adda as discussion with no agenda. These are conversations that are not just gossip, debate, or rants, but a blend of all three. Tele Bhaja and T complement the session of their Adda. Para Adda, Living Room Adda, these are portrayed in those stories. As for Tenida's uh, gathering with his four followers, 
this give a uh, give the reader a flavor of the outdoor adda of urban kolkata with expressions like chaturjeder roke boshe panch murtir gultani and uh, parar tele bhajar dokane dariye omlet satano so the author paints vivid setting of the adda discussions among film directors theater artists music artists among professors are very different because their adda was seen as intellectual discussions as a uh, integral part of bengali's life adda evolved gradually over time it has extended vastly from the chondi mandap the andur mahal and uh, the uh, calcutta coffee house boshonto kebin to the akashbani so uh, the exceptions uh, is also there just like how village adda and city or town adda is very different from each other the topic of discussions are very different and interestingly like uh, there are different form of uh, discussion for different professional groups ideas are also different with gender differences like coffee house saw a uh, foot uh, footfall of writers authors poets filmmakers but a roadside tea stall has uh, that type of people who are returning from of, from work from office and uh, while women were seen more interested about adda related to jewelry customs uh, sorry uh, uh, costumes and uh, food films and other family others family issue then men were uh, much interested in politics work about workplace they discuss about lifestyle they discuss about money and the market in books or magazines from bangladesh adda is mostly portrayed as a session where politics is used to be the main topic food or lighter subjects might might be there but uh, the whole adda dominated by the politic political topic there is a book uh, named bishonnata bishonnata shohor written by maskout asan uh, he talks about the adda and the politics of dhaka and uh, but the politics dominates to the adda session uh, and uh, muinul asan sabir has also brought the adda into his stories on a few occasions but unlike the writers from west bengal none of them has actually used the setting uh, of the adda to tell a story the upper classes leisure and the lower classes this may give rise to middle class and their thoughts where uh, where uh, they have dreams and desires which remain unfulfilled this unfulfilled dreams and desires take the form of adda where they gradually link and discuss about various other prospects it could be politics it could be discussion about an event an argument on a specific topic expressions and thoughts about many more things many more issues but mainly the gender gap was there because the topic of discussions were different among them with time as topic have changed so the gender gap reduced and nonetheless the evolution of para culture has grown with the bengali adda adda cannot be characterized as a specific public sphere and uh, it opens up uh, a space for giving free expression of thoughts and ideas on issues that often shift from day to day and every even within the short span of engagement but this amalgamation of expression argument discussion have a very strong power to change a social imagination change a social thought to change a political atmosphere to make or create a uh, create something very new for the society for the large amount of people cinema music books writings politics food travel art international event everything can be a part of adda and maybe for that this bengali community is very unique for the vast knowledge in almost everything because i think adda is the main source of that knowledge with time the popular adda which once used to be an integral part of bengali community has lost some of its glory on account to uh, account of rise individualistic character uh, culture but even then it has evolved accordingly the adda 
of chundi mandaps or andar mahal or long gone as the venus are non ex non existent now but uh, quite uh, surprisingly cafeterias restaurants shopping malls have replaced replaced them quite efficiently moreover the rise of social media has opened up a new avenue for the chattering bengali to continue their age old practice one can easily find the social media groups filled up with all sorts of communications from ever ever argumentative and talkative bengali the Shumi, answer, uh, may i interrupt yes. you have 2 minutes more okay sir the adda may have lost its original flavor of chair kape tufan literally means a tornado in a tea cup as bengali never shied away from their love of tea and uh, vortex of discussions and debate of any and each and every issue or topic present under the sun but it has uh, kept going by evolving itself with the need of the time it is never easy to confine a topic which is endless in a limited parameter however we often need to do what we do not desire to do so in at last uh, it can be said that adda is a two way of communication where everyone is simultaneously a speaker and a listener this very characteristic of adda allows formation of public opinion as we uh, all are aware of uh, that fact that people of good oratory skills often prevail uh, over others allowing the convincing of the masses adda is not exception of that phenomena in every group there are some people appreciously one or two whose opinion and or argument prevail over others uh, this has often been successfully em uh, employed intentionally or unintention unintentionally to form public opinion or to induce social change over time we can say certainly hope that we can uh, certainly hope that that adda will remain a definitive uh, marker for bengali culture and community given the jolly and friendly nature of bengali moreover it can offer immunity to the problem of individualism and individualistic uh, culture uh, it can be said that the bengali identity of bengali can always be found in a candid adders to be virtual it uh, in a tea shop in a tea shop in a cafeteria uh, in a restaurant because it is very much well known that two bengalis are enough to initiate a discussion and debate over each and everything under the sun very passionately thank you Thank you, Shomi. And our next presenter is Onnesha Chattopadhyay. Onnesha, please uh, unmute yourself. If possible, uh, switch on your video. Yes, we can see you. Uh, please add a brief introduction of yourself. Uh, uh, I you have, you have, you have. Yes, you are audible. You have twelve minute max. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Anvesha Chattopadhyay. I'm I have a master's from Jadavpur University, and I'm about to start a PhD at the University of Florida. Um, okay, my na the name of my paper is the Prodigal Probashi Bengali Identity in Kushinawa Chowdhury's The Epic City. I'll start with a little quote, quote which I believe encapsulates the essential essence of this uh, book. You are an American from New Jersey, Durbas. said you were born in buffalo you want to make me feel guilty about going to barista you american hypocrite who do you think would marry you who would be happy here except the little bow you can get from an arranged marriage who will cook you shukta and bhat which of your friends from yale or princeton would last out here a dabava extract part of a heated exchange between the author and his delhi bred bengali wife durba chatrach during his residence in calcutta perfectly encapsulates what i believe is the heart of kushanaba chowdhury is the epic city the question of origins of conflicting identity of food memory and hypocrisy are at the center of the traveler of come memoir as they are at the heart of much other contemporary diaspora writing in 2001 as his ivy league peers were preparing for lucrative jobs in finance management law or medicine new jersey bred princeton graduate Uh, Kushinawa Chowdhury left the United States for a low-paying job as a beat reporter for the Statesman Kolkata. 
In the years that followed, this Bengali Bajwal wandered the streets of his youth, attempting to live, love, and reclaim the city he had left behind at the age of 12. The Epic City, a non-fiction account of Chaudhary's travels and interviews in the city turning from Calcutta to Kolkata, is the parable of this prodigal Prabhachi, shuttling between two vastly different cities, both undergoing rapid transformation, one reading from the effects of 9-11 and the other from the gradual decline of communist rule, Chaudhary personifies a kind of transnational Bengali who is little seen in diasporic or native Bengali literature. Unlike the American-born confused Desi, the ABCD, for whom the city is an imaginary homeland, existing only in their own or their parents' memories. Different too from those who have lived in and written of Bengal their entire lives. The epic city portrays a kind of Calcutta culture which is very recent. The book was only published in 2017, yet already near extinct. The internet has gained ascendancy, political and economic allegiances have drastically changed, and the bowl shaped ambassadors and other signifiers the Chaudhary saw as evidence that nothing has changed since my childhood. The city was its, in its own time zone, a dwindling. In this book review, I shall examine Chaudhary's search for his own Bengali identity, as well as the different Bengalis he meets in his quest. Through the lens of both diasporic Bengali writing of fiction authors, such as uh, Chitra Banji, Divagaruni, Jhumpalahi, and Amitabh Ghosh, as well as non-fiction post-colonial linear authors, such as Suketu Mehta. I shall look at the themes that recur in his writing and there, such as the post-colonial connection between food and heritage, STEM and middle class and immigration, and the influence of American creative writing schools, and the way in this writing stands apart. Finally, I shall look at the trappings of nonfiction and travel writing as genres, and how they affect the content and style of the epic city. The model immigrant. Near the beginning of the epic city, the author in recounts his teenage internal conflict between the opposing impulses to return to a Bengali village and speak according to Gandhian principles, and his impulse to better his fledgling immigrant family by going to Princeton. To clear his head, Chaudhary drives to Princeton in the middle of the night and is pulled over by a policeman for speeding. The encounters of people of color with American police officers has gained increasing relevance in the light of It's not a moment. However, As dilemma, model immigrant, quote unquote. When the cop pulled me over, I was doing 74 in a 45 zone. He had been following me for quite some time. It would be four points and a hefty ticket, he told me. My parents are going to kill me, I muttered. He took my fresh license, my father's insurance and registration cards, and went back to write it up. He came with a reduced ticket, two points. Where were you going in such a rush? I was just driving, just trying to clear my head to Princeton, I said. I'll be going there in the fall. Sometimes I go there just to see what it's going to be like. He went back to his car again. I waited. A few minutes, moments later, he came back. Don't drive angry, he said. And don't believe everything those liberals teach you at that school. He let me go. On paper, Kushanava Chaudhary's origins are extremely similar to that of many other American-bred Bengali writers, uh, be it Diva Karuni, Lahiri, or the half-Bengali Bendikale. Born to STEM-educated parents, shouldering the burden of shared immigrant striving, non-white, but still accustomed to stable income, a reputation for reliability, a two-income, two-parent family, and many privileges that other immigrant communities do not enjoy. As for these other writers, uh, as for these other writers, these privileges are also accompanied by numerous responsibilities. In Neurosis as Resilience in Chumpa Lahiri's diasporic short fictions, Monaco Angelo writes, Lahiri's second generation migrants ep epitomize the psychic splitting generated by mimicry and assimilation to whiteness. Extending Homi Bhabha's concept of mimicry to racial issues, Engen Han maintained that Asian Americans are forced to mimic the model minority stereotype in order to be recognized by mainstream society, in order to be at all. By imitating Western norms and ideals, Asian Americans are exposed to haunting melancholia because they inherit losses from the first generations that lead to intergenerational conflicts. From such a perspective, stories in Unaccustomed Earth reveal Lahiri's engagement with the politics of racial melancholia. In the process of signifying melancholia, two tropes come into play, metaphors and prosopopoeia, that create a poetics in which every event refers back to the recollection of an impossible desire, condensing loss into narratives saturated with exposure to vulnerability. Lahiri's five stories in one novella chart the ordinary lives and daily rituals of Bengali American migrants who, in the wake of the 1965 Immigration and Naturalization Act, 
experience marital and filial conflicts in the unaccustomed world. Split between the model minority paradigm and the neurotic disorders it produces. Question of Chaudhary appears on the surface to be one such neurotic, and I do not mean that in any pejorative, uh, pejorative sense, immigrant. His biochemist parents have wavered back and forth between continents four times, and even when they finally knew, settled down in New Jersey, their encounters with the worlds are always underlined with the vain hope of return. Like the namesakes Gogol or the lost men in uh, Banerjee's uh, The Mistress of Spices, he is weighed down by the crisis of identity, like, as he evocatively describes it, Hugh and Sang's chair. However, unlike the immigrant forever severed from his home by the Kalapani, Chaudhuri does return, first as a young single reporter for the statesman, and then as a newly married man actively seeking out stories of the city, supported by a foreign research grant. He is allowed to live out the fantasies of his mother of childhood, be it the afternoons of Adda and Martin Curry, with similarly erudite friends, the Booth Bikil Bala Poets Corner, or the secular beat reporter's haunt of beef rolls, weak tea, and government ineptitude. However, while at first it seems like nothing has changed in the city of his memories, slowly the reality is filtered into his world, creating cracks in his prodigal paradise. The city of bowl-shaped ambassadors, first encountered in the 27th year of communist rule, slowly changes around him, and his account of this change is mired in ambivalence. His North Calcutta Ghoti maternal parents' home clings to its memories of previous glory, but must be supported by remittances from California. His father's small childhood home is unrecognizable. His Bengal pattern ancestors, he recounts, are as nomadic as he was. His grandfather was first forced to flee their ancestral zamindari by the partition. Then his father fled Calcutta for foreign shores. And finally, he brings things full circle by fleeing the America of his birth and settling in Kolkata. Salman Rushdie, in Imaginary Home Rants, wrote of the impossibility of returning home. It may be that writers in my position, exiles or immigrants or expatriates, are haunted by some sense of loss, some urge to reclaim, to look back, even at the risk of being mutated into pillars of salt. But if we do look back, we must also do so in the knowledge, which gives rise to profound uncertainties, that our physical alienation from India almost inevitably means that we will not be capable of reclaiming precisely the thing that was lost, that we will, will, in short, create fictions, not actual cities or villages, but Im invisible ones, imaginary homelands, India's of the mind. Vishanabha Chaudhary is not physically al alienated from India. He's present, he's present for large periods of time in the cities that he writes of, but his gaze is still filtered through the memories of his ancestors and the art he has consumed, of uh, Ashokonko's Don Bosco School, the movies of Rayan Ghatak and his grandmother's trauma. It may be that when the Indian writer who writes from outside India tries to reflect that world, he is obliged to deal in broken mirrors, some of whose fragments have been irretrievably lost. The shards of memory acquire greater status, greater, greater resonance, because they were remains. Fragmentation made trivial things seem like symbols, and the mundane acquired numinous qualities. The dual voltage appliance, flipping back and forth between continents like a dual voltage appliance. This is how uh, Chaudhary de uh, describes his own. both in American India, male, female, past, present, nation, vocation. It is the, quote, monomania of the 20th century, which forces the author, like his grandfather, to pick a side. Probably worries about the soul of the city as mills are shut down, old buildings are turned into high rises, and a new sector five emerges, populated by traffic circles and a new software-centric middle class. He laments that the jaw of city is made inhospitable to those as educated and upwardly mobile as he is, that there are no jobs or opportunities, and then feels resentful when the new jobs are created. He feels uncomfortable in the role of an upper middle class padrulo who employs an underpaid maid and admits to the gendered nature of housework, but surrenders after a short experiment at doing the chores himself. I posit that the core of this conflict is to his own conflicted Bengali identity. Chaudhary identifies as a Bengali, a Calcutan, an Indian. He carries an American passport and the memory of his international upbringing, but wishes to have the same sense of belonging as any other Indian born and bred Bengali. This puts him at direct odds with his wife, who is Indian and Bengali, and thus feels no desperate need to assert her identification with her linguistic community. 
and does not wish to live amidst its quote unquote mediocrity and moral compromises. Unsaid but ever present in this text is also the trauma which is also occurring at the same time, the twin tower of tax and the subsequent rise in nationalism and xenophobia, which buries immigrants in an otherness. Amisha, uh, please wrap up. Yes, please yes, wrap course. up in one minute. Yeah. Um, having examined this as, a uh, as uh, an immigrant novel, I'll just go quickly to travel writing. The travel writing is not new. Um, uh, there's Persian and Sanskrit influences to old travel uh, writing, and there's also a colonial uh, influence. Now, many critics, uh, including William uh, Darlimple, have uh, compared uh, this text to Suketu Mehta's The Maximum City, which is a travelogue about Bombay. Now, these two authors have similar backgrounds. They are both writing, uh, um, they are both uh, American established to have returned to write about their cities. However, unlike Mehta's memoir of Mumbai, Chaudhary's travelogue does not attempt to chronicle the fantastic. There are no interviews with dance girls, mafia dons, saints, film producers, or encounter specialist policemen in the epic city's pages. The individuals populating Chaudhary's pages are the same people an ordinary Bengali Bhadralok would expect to encounter in his daily life, architects, journalists, union workers, poets, tourists, and the odd politician. Accounts of bloodshed and calamity, while present, are not first-person interviews, but rather derived from memory, films, and history books. This avoidance of extremes could be seen as a flaw, as an, as an inability of the author to step out of his comfort zone, or an inability of the city itself to produce such larger-than-life personalities in the present day. The latter, as a Calcutta resident would affirm, is patently false. As for the former critique, there is certainly scope for Chaudhary to broaden the range of the people he interviews and paint a more intersectional picture of the Bengali identity. His work uh, briefly mentions casteism, rural Bengal, and other integral Bengali communities, such as the Santali community or the Marwari community, but does not actually include the lived experience of any people belonging to these communities. In one interview, speaking of the Naxal movement, an interviewee, Dipankar, even so goes so far as to condescendingly say that what made the Naxal movement special was that these were middle-class men with everything to lose, as opposed to tribals who had quote-unquote little to lose. However, in my opinion, this limited worldview is in a sense an advantage, as it paints an honest picture of the postmodern Bhadral of Calcutta experience, sans any melodramatic embellishments designed to draw sympathy from Western audiences. Chaudhuri is not, as he characterizes in an interview me here, too much of a raconteur to be like, facts get in the way of a good story. Borrowing more from the uh, pilgrimage literature tradition and less from the Indo-Persian account of events, Chaudhuri seems aware of this as he states, speaking of his, speaking of his own parents' experience of the Nakshal barrier era, in perhaps a nod to the lowland or the lives of others. If this were a novel, this would be the moment to reveal that my father, or better yet, my mother, had been a Nakshalite uh, revolutionary. A dramatic family secret would be let out, but life does not work that way. In those years of torture, imprisonment, death, and exile, my parents met, fell in love, married, moved to America, moved back. Everything has changed because of the Nakshalite period, but no one spoke of it anymore. The epic city is a requiem from that Calcutta generation, the generation that has left to one just beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Anresha. And our next speaker is Shourav Sharkar. And the title of our paper is Being Non-Bengali in a Post-Metropolis City, a Study of Kunal Basu's Calcutta. Uh, I therefore request Mr. Shourav Sharkar to uh, unmute himself to add a brief introduction and to present his paper. Shourav Sharkar. Are you there? Hello, Shourav Sharkar, are you there? I'm not getting any responses. Okay, uh, um, from from this participant's list, I cannot see any uh, Shourav Sharkar in the participant's list. Yes, uh, that's that's for me. Uh, so I move on to the next participant. Uh, our next presenter is Akash Hinha. Akash, are you there? Hello, uh, sir, am I audible? Yes, yes, audible. Uh, please 
announce the title of your paper, add a brief introduction, and start your presentation. You have 12 minutes at max. Can you be now. can you be a bit louder, uh, please? Hello? hello. Is it okay now? No. Uh, okay. No. Um, please use a headphone. Increase the level of the volume in your laptop or mobile, whatever you are using. Um, headphone. I don't know how. Uh, let me try. Yes. Is it okay now? Well, audible, but not very clear. Anyway, please carry on. Please carry on. Okay. Uh, I'm Akash Sina, and I'm from uh, University of Delhi. I'm currently pursuing uh, my MPhil in Comparative Indian Literature. And uh, the title of my paper is The Capturing of Transgender Identity in Bangla Cinema. And that I've done through a critical study of selected films by Ritu Porno Ghosh and uh, Kaush Kaushik Ban Ganguly. And the films that I've chosen for this paper are um, RFT Premier Borpo, Chitrangada, The Crowning Wish, and Nagar Kirtan. Uh, well, basically, I'm a literature student, and I do understand that literature and uh, cinema do share certain similarities. They go hand in hand. And uh, the the basic point that uh, there is that cinema has the capacity, cinema and literature both have the capacity to reflect the social developments and the social changes that are taking place in a specific period of time. And uh, this is a very generic and a very basic understanding. But beside this, there is also a, a point that we have to understand that uh, cinema and literature both have the capacity to incorporate certain new ideas or and also they can refashion and remodule our understanding uh, about certain concepts and about certain ideas so uh, when we look at uh, this idea from in a in the sphere of gender we call it the ge uh, technology of gender this term was given by uh, teresa d loritus and uh, there she made the point in uh, uh, in one of her essay that literary uh, literature and cinema has the capacity to introduce new ideas about gender uh, in the viewers or the readers so keeping this in mind i wanted to explore that how do these movies in are incorporating the movies that i've selected how are they incorporating the ideas of gender among the viewers but, and uh, considering the subject of the film that it is the uh, transgender identity, so there is a refashioning of gender, but uh, what is the nature of this reformulation? And secondly, uh, love is seen as a gesture of acceptance. So the transgender community has struggled and is still uh, struggling to find acceptance and uh, a position in the mainstream society. So uh, I wanted to explore the theme of love and companionship, which is projected in these films. Uh, but before I jump to the critical study of this, uh, these films, it is important to uh, clarify the term transgender. So the term transgender is an umbrella term, which usually incorporates uh, the diversified numbers of gender identities which do not fit into the typical uh, gender binary system. Uh, it is very similar to the, uh, the term called queer, which amalgamates the uh, sexual and transgender identities which are marginalized. But uh, here in transgender, uh, the uh, cat as a category, we focus primarily on the gender only. Now, uh, after having this idea, let's uh, move toward the first film that I've taken, that is the RFT Premier Board. Uh, this uh, film was released in uh, 2010, and this is written and directed by Kaushik Ganguly and Ritu Pornu Ghosh is, uh, is starred in this film uh, and who is playing the role of a transgender character. So basically, it's a film which has two love stories, and these two uh, love stories are running parallel to each other, but in different space and time. The first love story deals with a love triangle between Abhiru, Vasudev, and Rani, where Vasudev and Rani are husband and wife, and uh, 
uh, uh, Viru, who is a transgender person in the film, and he's a uh, documentary filmmaker. And uh, Abhirup and Vasudev are in love with each other. And uh, uh, keeping this in mind, they have uh, landed up uh, from uh, Delhi to Kolkata to shoot a documentary film on the real life legendary uh, Jatra actor, Chapal Bhajuri, who is also a, a transgender person in the film. And he used to impor impersonate the female roles in Jatra. So while recounting his past during the making of this documentary uh, in the uh, film, uh, we get to know that Chapal Bhaduri had also shared a rough triangle with the characters called uh, Kupa, uh, Kumar and Gopa, who were husband and wife. So uh, the interesting part of the film is the way these two transgender characters deal with uh, this love triangle situation. Their decisions uh, are influenced by the uh, character's identity in uh, respect to their conditioning in their respective space and time. Uh, the point that I'm trying to make in my paper regarding this film is that this film is showcasing two different kinds of tra uh, transgender identities and also there's a dialogue between these two identities and this is important. Uh, the uh, Abhiru represents the category of transgender identity who uh, see themselves as a third gender, stepping out of the binary gender and uh, challenging the uh, system and the institution of patriarchy, which uh, primarily functions on the basis of uh, gender binary system. So uh, this marks a departure from that gender binary system. Uh, but the second category, which is represented by Chapal Bhaduri, uh, relies back on the binary of gender uh, itself. He represents the category of trans who undergoes uh, hormone replacement therapy and uh, sex reassignment uh, surgery to correct their gender identity. So for a long period of time, feminism has questioned the demarcation and stereotypes made uh, based on uh, gender binary. And now when a part of transgender community tries to reassert the same binary, it gets a, a bit problematic. And this problem, or let's say the, uh, the fear of the puncturing this uh, feminist development is also evident in Chitrangada, The Crowning Wish, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which is a film by Ritupan Ghosh released in uh, 2012. The character uh, he's playing uh, in the film is called, uh, is a transgender character again, and it's called Rudra. And he's a choreographer. The plot of the movie develops as he meets Partho, a drug addict. Uh, interestingly, both the characters are socially, socially marginalized uh, in their respective ways, which draws them together to fall in love. And for the fulfillment of this love, Rudra undergoes the sex reassignment surgery. But Partho refuses to accept him after the surgery and uh, calls him a fake. So uh, moving on, the distinction between the real and fake gender identity is also asserted in Nagar Kirtan, uh, where uh, the character, and uh, the transgender person, um, Manubi uh, Pondapadya, there she mentions that how does society keeps criticizing the trans women by calling them as fake and not uh, genuine enough to be called a woman. Nagar Kirtan uh, uh, is a film written and directed by Kaushik Ganguly, released in 2017. It's a love story of Parimal, uh, uh, Parimal uh, who is also called Puti, uh, a trans woman, uh, or let's, uh, the better would be to call her the Hijra, because she is uh, acting the, the role of Hijra. And, uh, her uh, beloved is um, Modhu, a flute, a player, and um, a, deli a delivery boy. Throughout the film, we realize that there is a, a reassertion of the binary of gender. She wants to be a woman, and Modhu cannot accept her other than as a woman. So as I mentioned earlier, this reassertion of binary is dangerous, as it, is often, it often ends up reasserting those stereotypical uh, gender roles which were used as a medium to suppress the uh, identity of women 
but how do we take in account uh, the experience of an entire community which claims to experience to have a wrong body or who claims to be a woman from within their self so to this crisis i think we have to resort to the idea uh, of uh, the critic called uh, cindy stone who wrote this essay uh in a response to another essay so this essay is called uh, the empire rights back a post transsexual manifesto and this was published in 1991 uh, she critiques the idea of passing so uh, the passing is an act in which a person can easily be recognized or easily legally transformed as a desired gender person uh by the means of dressing makeup and uh even surgery the act of passing declaims the existence of the transgender identity and their experience it all it is almost like as if they are effacing their uh, transgender ident- identity or their past identity of a male to uh, to assert their present identity of becoming a woman so therefore the act, act of passing is uh, is something that should be avoided if we really want to uh, you know challenge this uh, the threatening aspect of the uh, this uh, whole idea of trans uh, gender where uh, there is an assertion or they relying back on the uh, binary of gender system so um, now i'm coming to my conclusion so all these films are uh, dealing with the tra- uh, different transgender identities and my job as a researcher here was to set a dialogue between these different identities so these identities are victim of patriarchy and no doubt about that that uh, the gender of biden uh, binary is potentially threatening to the entire, entire transgender movement and uh, this gets acknowledged in, in these films my argument is that uh, the fear is valid but this can be turned around if we uh, if transgender ident- uh, identity uh, reflects or uh, rejects the uh, the act of passing as asserted by uh, Shandy Stone in her essay thank you thank you akash uh, very good a uh, presentation uh, i ho- i i i think there is no question for the presenters uh, and as we are running very late i'm not allowing further questions um uh, well show me's paper is very interesting but uh, lacks a bit formulation i can understand that he is a post grad student onisha your presentation was very good um, but instead of multiple focus or multiple angle if you uh, just concentrate on a single issue i think your paper could be better one for publication you may focus on a single issue and akash your presentation is a very very good presentation i like it really uh, but uh, well um, your analysis regarding films it's accepted it's okay you need to work a bit on the theoretical formulations so that it can be a solid paper for presentation i think uh, for for publication if you submit your paper please consider this thing the papers can be very better one thank you all for uh, your presentation and dear audience for your patience um, and i i hand this uh, hand over this session to ramanuj thank you dr mondal thank you again for chairing another session and as uh, i request uh, my colleague uh, omod dotto to propose the vote of thanks uh, i am going to share the schedule for tomorrow tomorrow we will meet at 4 uh, the day begins for us at 4 and uh, there will be 10 paper presenters and most importantly uh, there is going to be an in- invited lecture by uh, dr shourit bhattacharya one of our distinguished research persons who is a lecturer in post colonial studies at the school of critical studies at university of glasgow he will be speaking on, on hunger food movement and modernist bengali poetry along 
with that we will have two business sessions uh, and in those two business sessions there will be uh, 10 paper presenters uh, omol please audible yes omol you are good to all uh, no 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 your voice is breaking i i think they need to leave and rejoin again oh Okay, I think we have lost connection uh, uh, with Amor. Uh, in place of him, I would like to uh, uh, deliver this vote of thanks for the day two. We uh, uh, begin this uh, uh, vote of thanks uh, by thanking Dr. Dipendu Bishes for uh, Dr. Dipendu Das for his uh, illuminating lecture and uh, i also would like to thank the chairs of the sessions dr pradeep pasham choudhury dr avin chakraborty and dr jatishankar mondal once again thanks to uh, all the paper presenters uh, looking forward to see you tomorrow again till then goodbye